good. <laughs> Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. And I'm Jess Dickey. And we are doing our wonderful feedback episode, but before we get into that, we are going to do the less wrong uh, sequences posts. Yeah, first. we're doing the posts first because, I don't know, we'll have all the time we need after that to go as long as we want in questions. And yeah. We're doing three because they're kind of shorter than usual, so... Yeah, sorry about uh, that. We probably should have... I don't know. I, I guess if you want to read along, pause real quick and go read... What was the third one? Go read You Are Not Hiring the Top 1% because... They the they were all pretty short, and we figured we can do three this time. Yeah, it'll go fast. Yeah, and honestly, you can pause and go read it in like two minutes. It's a pretty quick post. Totally. And uh, we're doing a whole feedback episode because we've been not having time for feedback for like the last two months. Yeah. So let's get caught up on some of that. Excellent. On what I'm sure will be a surprisingly small amount of feedback. <laughs> so. Aww. But we will manage to talk for an hour and a half anyway because we're just blowhard windbags. <laughs> we're dedicated like that. And then maybe more people will leave more feedback. Yes. <laughs> it's guaranteed that we'll just talk about their comment forever. Lather, rinse, repeat. Cool. <laughs> All right, let's get started. I was about to say, damn, that sounds depressing. The treadmill of podcast. <laughs> Except it's fun. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just <laughs> we love it. Yeah. Just if it's having fun pushing the rock, and that's all that matters. <laughs> right. So the first post... Uh, that we're going to discuss is politics is the mind killer. One of the famous ones. One of the famous ones, and at least definitely my top five. Oh, I did figure this out, and mm. I'll link to it in this episode. Um, wait, no, it'll be linked to in last episode. So listen to it in last episode um, <laughs> if you want. Uh, I discussed last week that there was, uh, or last two weeks ago, that there was definitely an audio version of the Darwin, like, what what is truth really? Okay. Uh, parable mm -hmm. and i was like are you sure you didn't do it Inyash? and you were mm -hmm. like i'm pretty sure i remember that turns yeah. out you were right it was on the um rationality from ai to, to zombies podcast ha i knew it yeah so it wasn't you okay but there is a great audio version out there that'll be linked to in the episode so fantastic go check that out from last week's and this week's why not yeah we should probably also include just a standing link um in our posts to the podcast version of the sequences as oh well. yeah that sounds great yeah and we'll start doing that too there are audio versions of the podcasts uh, of the uh, of the sequences there are actually two podcasts that cover it yeah there's there's two guys with awesome accents who do it and they do we're doing it for fun and uh free and then i'm not i bet the people who did it professionally more professionally did it for free or some volunteers or something maybe i'm not sure no i believe they paid for it and it was originally a thing you can buy and then miri went ahead and released it uh for everyone for free oh the like overcast or no wait because i had those okay i had a, i had a couple of those sequences i thought these sounded different but i wasn't sure I'll double check. I didn't I, actually check. Okay, yeah. Well, but, one is um, AI rationality to zombies, which is uh, curated differently. It yes, is. they yeah. both are. Yeah, so they're both doing rationality from AI to zombies. The old ones... Oh, right, so they were, won't... They'll be in a different order, and they may won't have all of the ones. In any case, there are two that you can listen to, so... Right. And they're both free. Yeah. All right. So, why don't you lead us in with Politics is the Mind Killer? Okay, Politics is the Mind Killer is basically what it says on the tin... We did talk about this briefly earlier, where someone pointed out that in the original Politics is the Mind Killer post, everyone remembers it nowadays, at least I certainly did, as well as being a, a sort of an injunction not to speak about politics in the rationality circles. Like, save your rationality for other, more important things. I'll, I'm going to go ahead and just volunteer that that's not how I took it on, on any reading. Oh, no? Just that that's not a good introductory subject for non-rationalists. Yeah. And that's that's the point, right? That is the point. Yeah. I was I was... Kind of surprised when I reread this because what I remember from God, it's it's been more than ten years now, but what I remember taking away from it, at least after a month or two of time had passed, was just like we don't talk about politics here. And I mean, at the time, since we he was still writing the sequences and we were going through this, it was an actual injunction because we were trying to do the whole learning of rationality thing, right? Yeah, and that would make sense. And he even says in this post that like you know this was when he was overcoming bias, and he wasn't going to say overcoming bias isn't political or isn't apolitical. But I'm going to try not to be just because this isn't we're not we're not going to get bogged down on reds versus greens or blues versus greens or whatever. Yeah. Um, on every little point we're making here. So we'll just talk about other like non inflammatory stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, hey, that that was an interesting perspective. And obviously, you know, the community has moved away from that over the years and done more and more with politics. But uh, for a while, there was, you know, whenever someone brought up politics, people just like, politics is the mind killer. Don't go there. And, you know, 
It's true. So in the post, it says that in the ancestral environment, politics was a matter of life and death. Uh, it could get you kicked out of the tribe, which would lead to you dying of, you know, starvation and exposure and whatever. And also, it could just give people license to kill you if you were on the wrong side of a debate. And if you're on the right side, you could kill your hated enemies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because he's uh, talking about evolutionary psychology, uh, he says politics were life and death in the ancestral environment. In a way, I would argue that it still is. Um, while in most parts of the world now nowadays, you probably won't literally be killed for your political opinions. Uh, having the wrong ones can still definitely cost you your career and make you a social outcast. Yeah, I think that's. I, I think it depends on how severe your opinion is or your your positions yeah. on some of these, and like how severe your workplace. Like for but the, the most part, part of the reason, is like why that's the case, why people are so insane about it, is because of the ancestral architecture reasons, yeah. right? And I but, think, I don't know, I I, I want to know. Okay, so I was going to say, I think it's not that bad because in workplaces all across the country, there's Trumpers working side by side with, I don't know, SJWs, right? They just don't talk about it at work because they're there to get a job done. Most work, it depends on the workplace, but yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of places, it just doesn't come up or it doesn't matter, or, you know, or you're encouraged, you know, not encouraged, but you're perfectly within your rights to have a fun, heated debate at lunch. But, you know, if you're talking about it, on the clock you're going to get told to shut the fuck up and that doesn't matter what you're talking about yeah but then you know i think about back to the 50s when people were being barred from doing anything in their industry because someone said that they were a communist yeah and today is in the 50s and there are people still you know losing their jobs and stuff over their political positions and some of those are like white supremacists you know who are outed for i don't know doing crazy white supremacist shit and then they get fired yeah. so they could say i was fired for my political opinion and i don't want to be dis dis uncharitable and say that they weren't but they were they were fired for having really really bad ones <laughs> so i don't know like there's there's a way to spin it that isn't it's not even a spin but like there's a difference between if everyone at my office was pro gun control and or like say pro gun taking them all away whatever you call it mm -hmm. uh whatever that version of control and i was for like stringent gun control but still private ownership if i got fired over that that'd be insane that'd be more insane than me being fired for on my personal time publishing blog posts about how Jews are destroying the environment and like sending money to the MAGA bomber or something. Right. So yeah. does that make sense? Am I, am I on a tangent or am I just, no. am I on a tangent that's so obvious that's not even worth talking about? No, it makes sense. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird. The, the way politics can still shape life because eh, like just was saying the wrong politics in the wrong office will hurt you. Yeah, having the wrong opinion, like, among your friends can lose you a lot of friends. Like, there's still consequences. Uh, it's just, I, I like, uh, thought that saying that in the ancestral environment kind of, like, downplayed the fact that this is still a thing that we do need to worry about. It's not like, as a society, we've all gotten over politics. Right. Where, like, they don't, you know, they don't matter anymore. They still do. But I think one of the reasons, he's pointing out one of the reasons that we are this crazy about politics is because back in the day, it used to be a thing where you could literally die or have your reproductive success greatly hindered. And the madness that we still have surrounding politics is from 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 that environment. I and think most people nowadays, if they were to check out of politics entirely and not have a political opinion, it wouldn't really impact their life, their day to day life, for the most part. Yeah, where like so that's the, that might be a part of it too. You know, depending on unless you're like at a rally with a mob, like saying I don't have an opinion on this is probably not going to get you stoned, right? Yeah. Um, and even saying I do have an opinion on this and it's different from most people's isn't going to be that big a deal. Yeah. But I just, I just see what you're saying, that, they're, that people are still crazy about it. And I guess I just didn't read it to be saying that we're not still crazy. I think he was saying, we this is why we're crazy. Um, not It's not politics was the mind killer, it's that it still is. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I still think the argument for tabooing politics in certain discussions is solid. Uh, because despite how much our political opinions shape our views of the world, and then like how we end up self-selecting the news we see and the groups we associate with, uh, our own personal political biases can be really difficult to notice. So I really appreciate what the sequence is trying to do, even though we've kind of moved away from it. Yeah. Well, somewhat. Yeah, no, I think that that I, I see the, the goal there, but I do think that it's important to be able to have discussions about whatever, including politics stuff, but you need to make sure that everyone on board of the, with the conversation is able to have it sanely, right? So, I mean, there are things that, you know, depending on the subject, probably any one of us wouldn't be able to like have a good conversation about whatever this is, right? So it's like, all right, I'm going to recognize that I am not equipped to have a conversation about that. I think the um, fact that we do get so uh, testy and hesitant to talk about things is sort of a, a in, in proof that it is still a mind killer. Yeah, and it's at least now we're aware of it. 
Yeah. There's also one of my favorite passages in all the sequences in this, which is why it makes my top five favorites. Cool. It's that politics is an extension of war by other means. Arguments are soldiers. Once you know which side you're on, you must support all arguments of that side and attack all arguments that appear to favor the enemy side. Otherwise, it's like stabbing your soldiers in the back. Yeah. And you that's, see that shit a lot. Totally. I've and, done that shit. Yeah, yeah. me no, too. And it's hard not to. And so, like, that's why I, I, I happened to get off Facebook right about the when right right around before Trump won the primary for the uh, uh, the presidency. Just in time. <laughs> Just in time. Yeah. <laughs> but but even like in the in the months leading up to that, I'd see people posting something about how I can't think of what it is, and it would be something that was like ob- like not true. Mm-hmm. and egregious and you know like hey this I can, you know whatever it is i can't remember what it is um the point is people are publishing lies about donald trump and i'm like you guys there are so many bad truths about <laughs> donald trump let's share those instead because mm-hmm. if we if we're out there lying to each other or lying lying to you know pat ourselves on the back people are gonna be able to point to the lies and say look they're lying over there we don't have to worry about the truth things that they're saying because they lied on this one occasion yeah and so it turns out how polar it turns out that it was surprising how polarizing that is to say, hold on, guys, that part's not true. Right. Um, what? Yeah. How dare you? You're a Trump. You're a supporter. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I told you about the feng shui thing, right? One yes. time. Yeah. Oh my Wait, god. Wait, tell me. Oh, well, th- there was a whole thing where uh, I was just friends with you know a bunch of. I mean, I still am friends with a bunch of left leaning people, but this was like someone very SJW ish, and she posted on Facebook about how she could not believe that her coworker got a white person to do feng shui oh. for them, and I was like. Because it's less bullshit when they come from the area. And I got, like, ripped apart by her and one of her friends. As in, like, how dare you be racist and shit. I'm like, look, it's still bullshit. I don't (laughs) care about the race thing. And it was was a big, big thing about, uh, I was was attacking the wrong person, I guess. I was one of those stab-in-the-back people now. I do like flipping it on and be like, you guys are being racist ones, assuming that Chinese people have this magic that they can do. Right. That sounds like super tropey to me. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. And we got to fight the Chinese magic with the America magic. and What's American magic? Uh, the ability to turn human pain into money. <laughs> or like that <laughs> A lot movie, of people can do that. Kill, we're better at killing dragons. Because wasn't there that Matt Damon movie a few years ago? Or wait, no. Oh. Hey, <laughs> not, not, not Matt Damon. Who was it? It was Matt Damon, was Matt yes. Damon, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think he was better at killing dragons than the stars. Wait, then what was he What was he in the movie for? Because he was just around? Uh, yeah, he was like one of the, the co-stars. The First of all, Chinese people love Matt Damon. Right. Oh, I knew all about <laughs> yeah, why yeah, he was yeah. in it and stuff. Right, right. But I was joking about that's what we have to bring to the table is dragon killing skills. I mean, he, he apparently was contributing in some way to the war effort, right? He was in the movie. I didn't see the movie. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> what was this, The Great Wall? That's yeah. one, yeah. Yeah, there was dragons I didn't see in it. Either. I heard it's good, though. I heard it was it People that did fun. watch it say it was actually surprisingly good. Mm. So I should probably watch it. If you watch it, you turn into a racist, though. Mm. <laughs> mm. What if you that's... steal it? There yeah. you go. Okay. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm glad we solved that problem. Yes. But so I think what I like about this is that we you know we chose some inflammatory examples, but the the idea that when having a discuss and I think everybody can think of an example from their lives where they're talking about um it well it's you know this is kind of the absurdity of like if I know your position on legalization of drugs, I can guess what or maybe that's probably more centrist now, but uh if I know your position on abortion, mm-hmm. I can guess your position on immigration and gun control and I don't know, your support of the your your uh, what do you call it comfort with uh, Russia Mm-mm. or something right which has gone way up in the Republican Party in the last five years so fucking weird man <laughs> from, from around ten percent to about thirty five percent now it the the fact that those all are on your side of the of the war mm. and why would they be correlated those beliefs have nothing to do with each other yeah. um, so that's that's the sort of thing that you you might be called out for saying oh no I'm I'm a liberal but I I think that I should own, be able to own guns and somebody might call you call you out for that or no look I'm a conservative but you know abortion is, that's that's obviously settled people should be allowed to have them you'll be called out for that too mm-hmm. um, and that's not even like a policy debate but that's just a a I guess in the metaphor I guess different battalions um, but they're all on the same side of the on the same army yeah anyway it's madness. So he said that the reason we want to taboo, or he wants to taboo talking about politics, is that though politics is an important domain to which we should individually apply our rationality. See? I actually should apply rationality. So weird. But it's a terrible domain in which to learn rationality. And he used the example that in AI, in artificial intelligence, and particularly in the domain of non-monotonic reasoning, 
which I don't even know if I pronounced that right because I don't know what that is. You pronounced it right. Okay, great. There's a standard problem. Quote, all Quakers are pacifists. All Republicans are not pacifists. Nixon is a Quaker and a Republican. Is Nixon a pacifist? That is Nixon a pacifist? And he goes on to say, what on earth was the point of choosing that as an example? Because you've just alienated whatever portion of your audience is you know, Republican. Or at least made them feel like, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, you're, you're trying to talk about an actual problem in programming, and you have just put a certain amount of people on edge and in, in defensive fight mode. Especially when in the, when the circumstance, you know, all A are B, all C are not A, uh, D is B and A, or D is B and C, mm -hmm. is D A. Like, that, you, you, I guess what I'm getting at, it could have been more abstract, and instead, you make it politically aggressive? Yeah. Yeah. I think it is actually, as a word problem, more comprehensible uh, to someone who's like a newbie programmer. But like, yeah, you could have picked something that was non-political. Yeah. And that, that's what he said, that it feels really good to get that jab in, but don't do it. Yeah, a lot of my college professors, I remember doing that too. And oh. it's it was interesting because um, I had college professors that had different political opinions. I mean, academia, you know, like they tend to think of it as leaning really liberal and a lot of them were. But I definitely had this one right wing professor. And I noticed it a lot more because I tend to be more left leaning. And he would just, uh, he was like very biased and he would use like his, uh, you know, personal anecdotes and like his like little jokes that were like kind of jabbing at the left all the time. And it was so irritating. Hmm. And then I realized that all my like left leaning professors were actually doing the same thing and I didn't notice it. I, don't know, I was kind of sitting there chuckling along like, ah, oh, good joke, professor so-and-so. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. And I know we do that on the podcast sometimes too. But we, we do. don't make an effort about being non. I mean, we 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 make an effort to not be political podcast, but we don't make an effort to be nonpartisan. Right. Um, and well, out of curiosity, did you go to a state school or a non-state school? It was a state school. Because I w I don't remember any of my professors being like. I guess I mean I I, I was at community college as a liberal arts major, and then basically psychology is a liberal art. Although I always like to plug this at CSU, it's a science class or it's a science major. So. Okay. Uh, because most places, it's a liberal arts major. But uh, I don't remember anybody... I guess I don't remember much of college. But I don't Not because I had a good time, because I was tired. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not because I was partying too much. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was cripplingly depressed. So it was like five years, kind of like mostly gone. That's creepy. Yeah. It's most of my life, which but is yeah, weird. I had one... Uh, that is weird. Wait, not not the crippling depression. My, you know, tepid, tepid, tepid depression. But my... I think I've been on this tangent before, but um, my... Like confidence in my autobiographical memory went really down when I learned about Elizabeth Lofti Loftist's, Loftist's research on how easy it is to fake memories. Mm. Oh, yeah. And then I, I realized that I, maybe I had some realization where I discovered that one of my memories was fake. And ever since then, I stopped trusting them. So I guess I've been in the background recycling them all into the bullshit bucket and they've all been <laughs> just being thrown out. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing how much I've forgotten of stuff. But it's not like... Nothing that's ever happened to you actually happened, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> But at the very least, it's not like I've forgot like addresses or like you know people or something. It's just like if you asked me to name a memory from eleventh grade, I would struggle to find one. Mm -hmm. Like I could, if you showed me a picture, I'd be like, oh, I remember that. But I don't have anything sorted that way in my head. Well, I don't think normally people don't just randomly recall things anyway. Memories are sparked by something else that's happening. Mm, when you're meditating, well, or at least me, but I've heard that this is a common experience. I just get random memories that I had completely forgotten. I get random thoughts, but they're almost never memories. No, I I like distinctly get memories from my childhood that I hadn't remembered up until that point, but they just suddenly come back. It's huh. really weird, and it, it's interesting because it shows that meditation is kind of doing something. Yeah. But uh, we are really derailing this. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to point out at the very end, it says uh, he has a note that now that he's been named as a co-moderator of Overcoming Bias, uh, he sh he's adding the disclaimer that it's just his opinion and not a statement of official Overcoming Bias policy, which. I don't know. I just thought that was kind of neat because it brings it back to the whole, oh yeah, this was originally posted on someone else's blog as part of a conversation. And I would assume they took that line out of overcoming bias AI to zombies. I don't remember that or line being in there. AI to zombies. The what? I don't remember that line being in there, although again, I could have just forgotten it. Well, it wouldn't make any sense in what is basically a textbook, right? Yeah. Um, it might not be in there. I'm not sure. I know that in the comments section, Hanson and Yudkowsky went back and forth a little bit on whether or not it was you know, appropriate to use political examples. Mm -hmm. And they, they came back and like, can we at least agree to like not make points just to get in that nice solid dig about how dumb your opponents are? And it was like, oh yeah, totally. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, so I think they, they kind of just hesitated a little bit on the, like how appropriate is, is 
polit- political discussion in rationality. They kind of went back and forth on that, but they were able to agree that like, let's not be dicks, yeah. which I feel like is a really solid baseline. Yeah. There's, there's one core value that my team has at work that we put together because everyone was supposed no to. No dicks. No, it was, it was be excellent to each other. Like oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> which which we settled on because don't be a dick. We had to write these down and put them on a board. So we, we didn't want to do that. But So um, that's what it actually secretly means, though. Well, they, I think those mean the same thing, right? Yeah, I no, like the, be excellent uh, to each other's better. Yeah. It's more positive and it's more like proactive. Don't be a dick is a don't thing, whereas be excellent is a do thing. Fair enough. I feel like they amount to like, many of the same behaviors but you're right one is like more helpful i actually don't think they amount to the same behaviors stopping doing things uh kind of puts you at a baseline but like be excellent means kind of go above and beyond oh then we should have we should have stuck with don't be a dick we're not (laughs) we're not we're not an above and beyond team (laughs) oh well it's aspirational yeah that's speaking of aspirations my daily aspiration at work is to suck a little less every day which is (laughs) I've been told I should have it be be a little better every day, mm. but I feel like this is an easier way to motivate myself. So <laughs> Whatever works for you, man. That's what works. Our next Less Strong Sequence post is Just Lose Hope Already. How appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it gives two examples, basically, of people who were all in on something and just kept going all in long past the point of reason. The more astounding example, which I'll quote here, is that LTCM was a uh, hedge fund. And uh, LTCM raked in giant profits over its first three years. And then in 1998, the inefficiencies that they were exploiting started to vanish. Other people knew about the trick, so it stopped working. LTCM refused to lose hope. Addicted to 40% annual returns, they borrowed more and more leverage to exploit tinier and tinier margins. When everything started to go wrong for LTCM, they had an equity of... 2.47 2.47 billion leverage of 124.5 billion and derivative positions of 1.25 trillion so these are guys that really should have stopped a long long time ago and just refused to give up hope so for us non-accountant people i know what equity is but i don't know the difference between leverage and derivative positions uh leverage would be basically debt that they had took on uh in order to borrow more sure yeah um, derivative positions, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was curious because it was like another order of magnitude higher. Yeah. And I don't know what the fuck you could do for $1.25 trillion. I... All right. Well, anyone who wants to know that can know that, I guess. Yeah, anyone who wants to tell us what a derivative position is in this case, please do. There's one guy who's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now my expertise comes out. Uh I'm glad that we're doing this reread because the sequence is so short that I and I read it so long ago that I'd actually forgotten it. Yeah, I had to. But um, I remember Professor Quirrell going to Pains to try to teach Harry how to lose in methods of rationality. So for whatever reason, that stuck in my mind. Yeah. More, but uh, I actually think that the lesson's better explained in the sequence, which is probably because it's in the form of a real-world consequence of losing money in continual failing business ventures than a lesson being taught by an evil wizard who obviously had ulterior motives. Right. I actually didn't buy it at all in the story when he was like, lose Harry. I was like, no. Really? <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, I don't know. I think what I think what Quirrell's trying to do was teach him that you need to know how when to not escalate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, so you keep keep how keep the stakes in mind and then see how high you want to how, keep going for that. Because, yeah, you could just burn yourself out. You know, if, the, if his stupid ploy to, what was what did he just win? Oh, he got Snape to apologize in front of everybody right. by threatening to walk out on Dumbledore and damn the whole future of, the, of Magical Britain. <laughs> yeah. So he was saying, like, look, if your thing hadn't worked, you'd, you would have just lost. And so he would have been expelled over what? Snape being a dick? Snape, or getting detention is what it was or something, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, come on. You need to know when to pull your punches. Yeah. So I think it's a good lesson for any aspiring Dark Lord. But... It does harken back to this too. So I well, the thing is though, even though this is like more, it's a better example, I guess, in the fact that it actually applies to real life, and you can see like, yeah, they should have stopped long before that. Uh, I the the I didn't remember this post, but I did remember sixth grade people beaten up on first grade Harry Potter. You know, yeah, that that stuck in my mind for I don't know ever. I haven't forgotten it anyway. It's true. And they are, there are, there are slightly different lessons maybe as part of the point too. Yeah. You know, one is like, when, know when to not escalate and know what, not when to not go all out because if you go all out and lose, you could end up totally fucked. But this is more just like, don't keep riding on wishful thinking, you know, have, have real realistic ambitions and keep them in check. It seems like it's the same lesson actually. Learn to realize when you should give up because you're losing. Yeah. 
I guess I, I had a difference, and then I spelled T on myself and forgot. <laughs> um, the people who, whatever, these LTCM hedge fund people, they didn't they didn't lose because they weren't trying hard enough, and they didn't, they refused to put all their cards on the table, and they took the kid gloves off and really just said, we're going to do this. They lost because the, the system changed, and there was no winning. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like... I feel like Harry, in that situation, if there was no chance of winning, he wouldn't have gone that way. He would have, have cheated or done something else, right? Well, I'm... So I'm it was like, no, th this is this is where I can keep raising the stakes. But there, he actually had stakes to raise, whereas these people were just riding on wishes. Well, knowing Harry, he probably could have done something to win against those bullies, right? But then that would have resulted in something even worse, like blowing up half of hogwarts sure yeah and <laughs> he had his plans on how to win too there was yeah. there was that part where he you know he turned on his real enemy the defense professor <laughs> right. uh, but the thing is these guys had a plan as well right they were they were making profits the next quarter they just kept borrowing and leveraging more and it ended up with blowing up half of hogwarts in financial terms for them i think the difference though is that they weren't actually they didn't they didn't have a plan or adapt or pivot when things got weird they just kept doubling down you know it's like it'd be like the person who goes to to vegas and they bring 500 dollars, they lose it all immediately so they go withdraw more money they start maxing out credit cards they start whatever black marketing organs and and <laughs> their watch and their wedding ring like at that point and they're still just playing blackjack right they're mm -hmm. they're, they're not they're not trying harder they're just keeping trying so there's a difference I, mm -hmm. I'm belaboring probably way too much, but I guess I wanted to... They felt different to me, and I wanted to articulate that. These yeah. people are just playing blackjack over and over and refuse to acknowledge that blackjack is a losing game. Um, actually, blackjack is a great game if you want to sit and play. <laughs> it, your odds are pretty good for, as far as poker, but... Um, They're only slightly less than one and two. Yeah, which is not bad. <laughs> right. uh, well, I like games where you're just playing against one person. Okay. Uh, like, oh, Don't get me wrong, I actually like Hold'em more because it's a longer game and it's more fun, but the... So you actually like these card games? The, I mean, a little bit. Yeah. It's actually like the one thing, if I could, I, I've found, I've watched all the videos I can find online, but it's like the sport that's on in a restaurant or something. It's the one I'll sit and like not pay attention to a conversation watching like high stakes poker. Huh. I think that's a lot of fun. I've never seen know. high stakes poker on a TV in a restaurant. It's because it's not that common, but it's out there once in a while. Yeah, we must go to different restaurants. <laughs> yeah, you got to go to enough, like, I don't know, shitty sports bars or something <laughs> on the off seasons. Yeah, I try to avoid those. There you go. Um, I'm going to get back to your point, Stephen. But, uh, and maybe this is just me, but I, while I agree with what this sequence is saying, I don't like the negative tone of just lose hope already. Right. Uh, even though the focus is on knowing when to stop trying, I think the point might be at the expense of the value of failure. Well, they had like, there was the, um, hedge fund and then there's this fictional character Casey in the sequence who keeps failing. And the writing actually kind of made fun of Casey and saying like, he hasn't failed. You see, he just had a learning experience and yeah, so he had failed at trying the same thing eight times. And he's about to try again the ninth time, so he's clearly not actually learning from the failure, which is like what you were saying, Stephen. I don't think that was a fictional character, was it? Oh, was it? No, that, <laughs> was, think... a re that was a real guy. That was a yeah. real person. So, uh -huh. I think what he was saying when he is like, oh, you see, he, he just had a learning lesson, or he had a learning moment, which I think he put that in like the kind of sar sarcastic italics because that's probably what he's saying to people and why he's trying for the ninth time doing the same thing. No, 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 I'm just, I, those were, the, you know that that wasn't failure that was experience and it's like yeah but you're not you're doing the same thing yeah right? well, we have a lot of societal kind of you know fall down fall off the horse nine times get up ten and uh also like if you just believe really hard but uh no failure i think can actually be really important although it's mostly like important because it tells you that you need to alter your strategy or try to do something else instead so yeah i don't actually disagree with the sequence i'm just not a fan of the tone <laughs> Yeah, it is pretty negative sounding. Who hurt you, Eliezer? I think I'd have liked it more <laughs> if it focused more on the how to be smarter and how to calculate your odds of success part of the... They, they just kind of like mentioned that. Yeah. This I, is what you should do, and then moved away from it. It just like reinforces to me that failure is shameful and should be avoided at all cost. And meanwhile, I think most people don't fail enough because they're so risk-averse and afraid of looking bad that they never try anything. Hmm. I definitely see how that's an interpretation. That's not how I took it, but I totally see how he, he opened himself up to that reading. I think... What he would say is like if you fall off a horse five times, like check the stirrups or yeah. like adjust your grip the sixth time. Don't just get back on and fall right back off. Like there's so it's about actually adapting and actually learning from your mistakes. Yeah. But he doesn't spend Stop. enough time on that in this in this post. Stop just having hope that it'll be different this time and actually do something. Yeah. And uh you know, like you said, as far as like things you can actually do, you know, he's there's a one of our notes here was 
every profession has a has a different way to be smart, uh, different skills to learn and rules to follow. Which uh, I put known here, that's kind of the thing we talked about uh, in the last episode with the person who said civilization is basically systematized winning already. They a lot of a lot of our organizations in life have these rules and systems that are guide you into winning as long as you follow them. Yeah. And that that's Elias is basically saying the same thing here. Each profession has ways to to succeed at it. Yeah. And the, the next point too is one that I made when someone asked like well, how do I apply rationality in my real life, which is yeah. like I try not to suck. Yeah. But how not to be stupid has a great deal in common across professions. Mm -hmm. And there was a, one of my philosophy professors to find wisdom as like the skill of not sucking at life. And I, I liked that, and it could be you know the skill of excelling at life, but I like I like the, the not sucking because it's more, it's more generic. There are there are pitfalls that you can fall into basically wherever you are, and identifying and blocking against those is good. Yeah. But there are different too many directions to reach in to have like generic advice on how to win. I think right. Yeah. I think a lot of advice on how to win is really advice on how not to lose. Yeah, he says yeah in continuation of that quote. If you set out to teach someone how to not turn little mistakes into big mistakes. It's nearly always the same art, whether it's hedge funds or romance. And one of the keys is this. Be ready to admit you lost. Yeah, maybe maybe he didn't think of the line, learn how to lose until later. Because that would have been a better name for this post. Yeah. Rather than just lose hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's still pretty negative, though. It is. I think... I think I had a hard time with that, too, even when I was reading Methods of Rationality. That was kind of why I had the knee-jerk reaction of, like, no, don't, you know, learn how to lose. Learn how to win better. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> And that's the lesson Harry takes, and he's ready to destroy the universe to do it, right? Yeah. So, so the whole story is kind of that lesson. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff. All right, as long as we're in tangent land, how are you liking Horizon Zero Dawn? It's really good. Yeah, I'm actually like Val vindication, <laughs> validation. I'm, I'm playing it very slowly because my temptation is to just like burn through story mode really quickly, and I'm trying to draw out the experience. So I'm doing all the like side quests and kind of just wandering around and trying to explore the world. That's what I did. I went through and played. I took off all of last week for Thanksgiving, and I played God of War all the way through the new one. Nice. And when I started the game, I always look at the settings to see like what I can change about it. So I turned off a bunch of stuff that I think made it way more immersive and fun. So there's like a compass, like a lot of games have, like that tell you where to go at the top. Yeah. I made that only show up if I touch the middle part of the controller. Cool. So it's not like I'm not just staring at the compass and keeping myself aligned the whole time. I'm looking at the world. Yeah. I turned off uh, enemy health bars unless I do the same thing, touch the thing, mm -hmm. and a couple of other things that just like. And I also put it in hard mode, which I try. I always try a game in hard mode first and then get frustrated because I die immediately and <laughs> send it back to regular. Mm. But I never play in easy mode because that just... it Too easy. It t well, and it takes... it's All that does is just make the enemies like have less health or give you more damage. Mm. And it, it seems like it, it artificially, deliberately makes the experience easier. And part of the experience is like supposed to be challenging. Yeah. You know, like parts of Horizon Zero Dawn are supposed to be scary and frustrating because there's no way you can beat this thing. Yeah. And many times you're like, holy shit, I need to get out of here. Yeah. But if you know you can just cheese it from a distance by throwing rocks at it or something, then it takes away some of the fun. That's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to the World of Warcraft Classic. Yeah. It's because it was actually really fucking hard. I like hard games. It's kind of a problem. Okay. Anyway, God of War was fun. Yeah. I had a great time with it. You know, I never really liked the open world games because of all the side quests and shit. I feel like if I don't do them, I'm missing out on a lot, but... What I really care about is the main story, and so I spend hours and hours on these stupid side quests, which distract me from the main story, and I lose focus, and it just, ah, uh, it's really frustrating. So bad games make side quests feel like busy work, mm -hmm. and good games make side quests feel like this other awesome thing you're lucky you found. Yeah. And I think Horizon Zero Dawn does that really well. Like, there's this whole expansion that I didn't realize was the expansion mm -hmm. until I'd played most of the game, then I googled, like, what does this expansion actually cover? And it's like, oh, that whole northern part of the continent. And uh, you get up there, and there's the whole self-contained kind of story, but you're really interested in it and that sort of thing. So I think it did a good job there. Yeah, but, the writing uh, in the game is good enough, and like it ties into the world building, and you know, there's actually cool characters. The, yeah. Totally. The last two games like that I played were uh, Dragon Age 3 and The Witcher 3, both of which are like apparently the best games ever, right? But both of them, I just didn't get all that into them. I couldn't get into those either, and I think it's just the camera. I couldn't mm -hmm. get in. I tried Witcher two and three. Couldn't get past the controls. Like I, I know that's like a weedy, like that's that's a, a weak complaint. But mm -hmm. it was clunky to play, and it was like, eh. I just didn't get sucked in. No wait, I take that back. I tried one and two. I never tried three. Okay. Um, God of War is a good hybrid of like it's open world, but not in that sense that you can scale any mountain you want. It's like, hey, here's where you're supposed to go, but you don't have to. You can go to wherever else you feel like you can get to, or that you can, you know, you get things that unlock parts of the game through the stuff. So if you can't get past that, you can't get past it or whatever. But 
when you go th down these little side rails, it's kind of, it's fairly linear maps. It's not like, like I said, where in like Horizon Zero Dawn or Skyrim, you can just run up any mountain and see what's up there. This is much more of a contained experience, but not in a way that feels constricting. Cool. Anyway, I like video games a lot. I feel like, the, <laughs> I feel like it's, it's an underappreciated medium for like telling great stories and having a great time. I think it's much more appreciated nowadays. It is, but it, but I mean, even just 10 years ago, people would give me shit about like being excited about the next video game. Those people sucked. They did suck. And I'm like, it's like being excited for the next book, except this book takes me 600 hours to read. <laughs> like, it's going to be great. So, And you're controlling the protagonist. Yeah, and you're controlling the pro protagonist, and you get to help write the story in some of these games, right? Mm -hmm. um, like Horizon Zero Dawn and God of War, you don't. The story is going to be what it is, and you can just uncover as much of it as you can playing through. And that's a great way to deliver the great stories that those games have. But like... Um, I don't know, Skyrim, you can kind of, you don't get to like side with the dragons at the end or whatever, but you could be a total monster and an assassin all the time if you want, or you can be a, you know, paragon of virtues. So anyway, that's my video game rant. Excellent. Were we doing something? I forget. Uh, we have one more sequence <laughs> post. <know>. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me. No, that was cool. We were going to do the video game thing chat at some point and it just got squeezed in between post two and three now. Lucky you guys. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Our last one is you are not hiring the top 1%. Again, another negative post. I feel like, yeah, you know, what what's what was going on the, like this particular week? week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where he makes the point that when you get 200 resumes and hire the best person, does that mean you're hiring the top 0.5 percent? Uh, because a lot of places do advertise that we only hire the top one percent, and I know a lot of um, a lot of tech companies. Well, I was gonna say, maybe I don't know. I was gonna say that uh, um, short story markets will publish you know what percentage of uh stories that they accept that they receive they actually accept and publish and if, you know for some of them it's like one percent or less uh but he goes on to say what happens to the other 199 candidates that you didn't hire they go look for another job <laughs> so uh it may only be a few good people that are getting hired and the other 199 people are just the same terrible people rotating going from employer to employer making everyone think they're hiring the top 1% when they're they're just hiring average people who aren't the shitty bottom 199. Yeah. So part of this is just failure to understand like how distributions work and how samples work. And so like it's like math problems. Like you just you when you say this you don't actually you can't write on on paper in like numbers what you mean without without contradicting yourself or without showing that you don't really understand what you're saying. But the other I think the other point there is um slip my mind mm -hmm. i guess i don't know this this is something that yeah right a lot of companies or publicists or things will tout like we only do the best and it's like no you you don't you do do you do what everyone else is doing it, it's, it sounds like it does sound good at, at first right at first blush and you know my my little question here at the bottom is what does this have to do with rationality yeah is that a real <laughs> question yeah oh i thought you had like a i thought that was like your prompt to give an answer well, part of it is just noticing that they don't understand probability distributions, but maybe they don't not understand, but it's a marketing ploy, like trying to get investment money or to make their company look good. I think a lot of people really believe in it. I had a teacher once who wanted us all to do the best in the class. <laughs> <laughs> and I pointed out in front of the class, because I was an obstinate student, that like, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. We can't all do the best. Because I had this joke that went back, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld who was like, you know, doctors, there are some doctors graduating at the bottom of the class mm -hmm. and whatever a passing grade is, there are doctors who are squeaking by and somebody's got an appointment with him on Monday is the joke. Um, but you know, so whether a passing grade is a doctor is a 90% or 70%, there are, there's somebody graduating at the bottom of the class cause they can't all be the top of the class. Yeah. Even if they're all getting a pluses, somebody, somebody's doing better than the other people or your measuring metric sucks. Cause if they're all getting hundred, if they're all getting a pluses, 104%, then you're not measuring anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, apparently that's a lot of how school works. Well, it is. But like, so the example I gave my teacher, cause she was annoyed at that and said, said that it was negative thinking. I was like, we can't all be the tallest person in the class either. Mm -hmm. we, you, you get up. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was this annoying as a child too, but I was, uh, 19 probably when this happened. Your teacher told you that shit, <laughs> said that shit to 19 year olds. She, this was a community college English teacher. Oh the only reason, God. yeah, it was a nightmare. Like I can see trying to tell that to fourth graders and thinking it'll fly, but I cannot see anyone trying to tell teenagers. I want every one of you to be the best in the class and not get like, she, she wanted it to be like a, a, a positive thinking thing. And I'm like, that's fine. You should say you want us all to kick ass or us all to do great, but we can't all be the best in the class. That's just not how the best works. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't remember what she said to my tallest example, but she might have said that as negative thinking or something. I don't know. <laughs> it sounds kind of negative. <laughs> but we like, if, if she expressly was just trying to use it as a positive thinking experience, just let her have it. She totally sucked. <laughs> oh, well yeah. then. No, she was a bully. Then she, punish her. She, yeah, she, she, was, she sucked. But, and it wasn't just me who thought that. She gave me so much shit that no less than three other students came up to me at some point and was like, what is her problem with you? Hmm. And like, that's a good question, man. <laughs> and then somebody said. She was said, just trying to inspire you to be the best, man. Oh, no. Like, the, all the time throughout, like, the rest of the semester, she'd call me out. And that's tried, how she inspires tried, you. Tried to get me to drop out and stuff. Yeah, it sucked. Um, but no, the whole, I don't think it's negative. There are three of us in the room. One of us is the tallest, right? <laughs> that's not negative. That's just true. Wait, she said that the tallest example was negative. I don't remember what she said about that, but I'm, I, I maintain that those are similar, that those are analogous enough to make sense. I do see how one is being not positive. But I don't think one is being not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't have much to say about, um, you're not hiring the top 1%. I did want to highlight that there was a comment from someone called kickstand that said, consider this, 99% of the human population knows nothing about programming. Thus, any programmer you hire is in the top 1%, hmm. which is a little bit more positive or a little bit more uh, kind of puts it again, like in, in a different context. I think what it has to do with rationality, why it's included in the sequences is because it does point out the fact that people aren't thinking, I guess, to fall back to this term, they have a bad map of the world where they assume that since they have these 100 candidates, and they pick the one best one, they're hiring the top 1% without looking at the, the greater territory and seeing what, what the representative, sa representative sample actually is, right? And rationality is a way to, you know, reevaluate what you're seeing and try to really see it in the greater context so that you're not fooling yourself. Yeah, at the very least, just understanding, I think there's also a kind of a precondition that's never made explicit because it's almost never necessary in the sequences, but uh, a prerequisite for being a better rationalist than me is like some math skills. Mm. Like if you don't know enough about probability theory to follow exactly why that's the case, then then Eliezer might say, look, grab a math book and get caught up. Well, it's 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 not even math. It's pretty simple once someone points out to you that, look, it's just the same terrible 199 people all the time. So the top one isn't really the best. It's just better than those people. It's um, it's just a way of stepping back and looking harder as opposed to taking things at face value, I guess. Is there any example that we can use in our real lives since we're not hiring people? To yeah, yeah I was this? kind of thinking that like it's a fun thought experiment. Uh, how would you actually munchkin the job market? Is it like, okay, we need to just snipe people from other companies? Because like, you know, if, if they're already being hired, so they're taken out of the job pool, well... <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, good luck, because I mean, all the, all the best people are going to be working at Google and Facebook and all the, the big four, right? So. That's Go try to find undiscovered people who aren't in the job market, <laughs> like, right. give them most, an offer. Most people do try to hire away from other companies. Yeah, that, but you're never going to hire away from Google because they're going to pay $60,000 more a year than you are. So. And there's the thing that like once you're in a relationship, that's when people actually want to start dating you or something, right? Yeah, it's same with the same with having a job. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot easier to find a job when you have one. Maybe it's maybe it's for the exact same reason. <laughs> maybe my, my people thing, know this. Well, no, well, it's, I think it's that. Maybe you're confident because you don't need a job now. And oh, people yeah, are like, yeah. you know, whatever. But the other thing is that somebody else has already taken a risk on you mm -hmm. and said, oh, okay, they're, they're safe enough bet. You know, if someone else has already, you know, either paying them to work there or dating them then they can't be all that bad so that's already weeded out a lot of the bad people for me yeah it's yeah. social proof yeah i guess i just realized the social proof for dating and for a job market is the exact same thing in that context yeah. <laughs> okay so right. that was our sequences for this week huzzah for next time we will be talking about policy debates should not appear one-sided and birch's law and there will be links to both of those on um our website which is TheBasinConspiracy.com? That sounds right. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm having a brain fart right now. I'm oh, no. sorry. <laughs> I'm, 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 giving you I'm going time. to edit that so I do not sound nearly so stupid. No, you're good. I, I thought it was funny. <laughs> and my, my response was knowing that you're having a brain fart and playing along. So. You son of a bitch. On to listener feedback? Yeah, why not? Unless we want to do this video game talking thing. <laughs> nah. I, oh, I guess there was one small thing, actually. I've got a little section in the notes for video games because it's, it's literally one bullet point. Mm. Uh, Steven's video game, Connor. That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah, Stanley died effects. a couple weeks ago, oh. Yeah, which is a huge bummer. Mm. Um, and I had played through the Spider-Man PS4 game a couple months ago, and uh, it was fun. It was perfect, I don't know, three out of five. It mm. was fun to play, fun to look at, good story, but like kind of repetitive. A um, lot of weird, like bizarre, f like these were the side quests where they felt like just, you know, ridiculous 
sidetracking work. And it's like, why are you literally spending time catching pigeons when <laughs> is that a uh, side quest? there's a side quest to catch, that makes p- me catch, play that catch game, pigeons boy. for a crazy homeless person? Um, so, yeah. Is it like, just to be nice to the homeless guy? Yeah. And for whatever reason, he has Spider-Man's personal phone number. I'm not really mm-hmm. sure. Maybe he's uh, relevant in the comics or something. But anyway. Did, does he eat these pigeons? No. He names them and stuff. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> if he eats them, it's pretty fucked up. Um, You're helping feed the homeless guy, man. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Stan Lee had a cameo in that game, which I didn't see coming. Uh, Peter and MJ are at this like little diner, and then they're like kind of like they're, they're apparently in the point in the game. It's eight years after he got his spider bites, and none of this like you know preamble stuff. This is also after Infinity War because there's Avengers Tower and stuff. Hmm. And uh, they're any, anyway they he has to run out to go chase the police cars, and then the line cook that you only like kind of saw like his shirt from the camera angle before. He was like, I'm so glad the two of you are back together again. You always were my favorite. And it, it looks at him, and, and it exactly looks like him, and it was him doing the voice. Cool. So it was fun that he had a, vo- had a cameo in there. And I like to think that, that that was, like, a line that he actually believed. Like, they, you know, that was always his favorite couple, maybe, in, in his in his stories. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Stanley seemed like a genuinely great dude, and it's a bummer that he's dead. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there were so many great stories about him that came out after that, like, that I just didn't even know about, like, how, you know, connected he was to his fans. Yeah, I don't think he was ever the kind of guy that got, like, too big for his britches or hated being bothered. You know, he, he was a guy with a schedule and probably couldn't, like, stop and talk for every, to everybody for half an hour, but I think he went to conventions and stuff because he knew that it was important to people, you know, to say hi, so. Oh. Anyway, he seemed like a down-to-earth dude. And I like that he genuinely loved the things that he made, too, and, like, yeah, that makes not a in difference. a way that strangled them to death, either. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Uh, Rachel and I, my, my fiance and I are talking about uh, the people who were in Twilight apparently hated those movies <laughs> uh, Robert Pattinson the guy who played Cedric Diggory actually. well they were all directed yeah. to behave like weird robot people yeah no I it mean it doesn't make them look good as actors oh no I'm sure it was garbage and like to work for and like I saw one of the movies it was terrible like all, all that aside though I know that they've been at least Robert Pattinson has been pretty vocal about much, how much he hated working on these movies and how bad they are mm. but I feel like and maybe it's a bad example. I was just thinking of somebody who talks negatively of what they did. You know, he could have said it was great working with the people I worked with or something, but maybe they all sucked. <laughs> maybe that's not a relevant point at all. Other than some people don't love what they do and it comes out, right? If I, you do love what you do, people are excited about that. Man, I don't... Unless you jump on a very popular hate train like Twilight. Right. Like, why is he hating on Twilight? It gave him a hell of a paycheck. It made his name really big. And there's, you know fans of the movies that enjoy them because they just like the movies yeah i wonder what his hate of the movies does to the fans who like the movies right yeah don't don't be a jerk man i so the guy who i i recently watched a, a short youtube video about the making of the super mario brothers movie which oh yeah fucking train wreck it turns out i mean oh, the movie itself movie. was awful really <laughs> <laughs> well it's good in scary quotes right right it's a good bad movie but the guy who played Mario... It's a great bad movie. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so entertaining. <laughs> but the guy who played Mario... Yeah, but apparently the whole set was a wreck. People hated each other. They People started drinking on the job because they were like, <laughs> this is awful. How are we going to get through this day? Wow. But uh, the guy who played Mario, years later, uh, he was like a pretty like classically trained British actor, you know, had a bunch of good roles. Uh, someone was interviewing him and they, were like, and they asked him like, what is one thing you uh, regret about your life? And he was like, Super Mario Brothers movie. <laughs> okay. What is uh what was the least great thing that you ever worked on? Super Mario's movie. I'm like, okay. All right. If you could go back and change one thing in your life, what would it be? He's like, I wouldn't have done the Super Mario movie. <laughs> he really, really hated that. And I mean that I think is a legit complaint. As opposed to Twilight, which has some artistic merit and fans and, you know, a lot of good came of that movie for the people involved in it. Yeah, I think it's it's got to be a bizarre situation working on a movie with people who like you're not getting along with. Mm. I do this thing now when I'm watching TV, and especially if I'm seeing like a rerun. Um, you know that feeling like when you're at the movie theater and you're like immersed, and you're not you're not you in the movie theater. You're you're just having the experience of the movie. Mm-hmm. And then whatever it is, you somebody in the audience laughs or whatever, and you're kind of pulled out, and you're like, oh, I'm in the movie theater, and I'm watching mm-hmm. the movies, and like I'm seeing light on a screen and kind of just like that distance to it. Mm-hmm. I've been for fun kind of amping that up when watching things. And I love watching like people act and this is totally not relevant to anything, but it's just, I was doing this last night because it was somebody like kicking stuff around on a, on a set, like as part of the, the joke, mm-hmm. but things were happening. You know, if you're kicking props, they're not going to always do the same thing. So like the jokes that you're making about that are all like, you know, in the moment. And yeah. that chemistry has to be like real appropriate and like 
aware and like everyone like I, I, I've been appreciating the skill of acting I think is what I've been doing cool but I can't imagine trying to do that with people that you fucking hated that's bizarre uh-huh. <laughs> anyway now I kind of want to watch the Super Mario Bros movie again <laughs> speaking of wastes of time yeah okay we're we're doing a podcast right we are doing a podcast let's move on to listener feedback bam bada bam okay well, uh, there is a longer quote by Son Derive, which was, I don't even remember what episode this was from. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole quote because it's long and there was a lot of it. I think uh, this would have been from the um, Culture War 2.0. Okay. They did want to say, first, I'd like to caution against what I perceive as an increase in bashing of non-rationalists for having biases. Everyone has biases. The vast majority are unaware of the majority of their biases and haven't put any effort into learning about it. That's not surprising. That is why we care about raising the sanity waterline. Uh, it's like bashing people for not getting the God question right. It feels like bashing on children. So first of all, I want to say yes, that is true. Point well received. Um, that but, also gets a good solid dig in at those stupid religious people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. kidding. But it is, I think, I, in fact, I talked with Jess about this a couple weeks ago. We went out and I was pretty like, I don't know, ardent atheist for the first few years that I discovered it and read the God delusion. And, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, the... I think everybody goes through the asshole atheist phase yeah. when they it first was... deconvert. I had, I had, it I had was like 10 years of, of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, it, it, and it was bonding, man. Yeah. You bonded the people and, and the, the part of why it was fun is the debates were so easy because there was three arguments that people would make, you know, you, so you would just get really good and it was kind of like, yeah, like fighting kids. Dude, the best. But that oh. sounds mean. It's not sitting, I'm sitting on religious people. I, I, do, I do think that religions aren't true, but I don't give anyone shit about it anymore. I still remember um, the, what was it? The forums that I was on. God, what was it called? Fuck, I don't remember. Uh, Reggie was the name of the, 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 it wasn't even podcasting back then. Just guy who did things online. Uh, but he had a forum and there was a guy named Todd, Todas Angst, who I loved, who was just really acerbic and would always be kind of assholeish to people right but uh and people would say like that's an ad hominem attack he's like no it's not if i were to say you're stupid and that's why your argument is wrong that's an ad hominem because that doesn't mean your argument's wrong when i say you're stupid that's just an insult <laughs> it's like you, you are the best that's a good quote too <laughs> yeah. but uh there was this one guy called geek for christ who whose avatar was the little cucumber from the veggie tales show and he came in there and he was all enthusiastic about Christ and we were just arguing with him. And after several weeks, he started to have doubts. And after like a couple of months, he was like, I think you guys might have a point about this whole God thing. And I was like, holy shit, it worked. Oh my God. It was the coolest thing. I'm surprised that that kind of browbeating would work. But I guess somebody who's opening well, themselves up to that. It wasn't would just be... browbeating. It was like a lot, a lot of debate and some of it was a bit heated, you know, and every now and then Tata Sanks would walk in and do his thing. But he also made really good points, you know? Yeah, kind of like Richard Dawkins' style to doing that. I suppose. Yeah. He, he doesn't really worry about playing nice, but he's not an asshole. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Especially, like, if someone's coming in and just... It's, it's like a good Reddit thread, which are rare and rare, but it depends on the subreddit. But some of them come in... I like No Stupid Questions. It's one of my favorites. Because people will typically answer, like, hey, yeah, why can't you eat dirt? That's a really good question. <laughs> and they'll, they'll explain why. Oh, cool. I, so, like, if someone came onto this forum that you're talking about and it's like, hey, you know, what do you guys have to say about the resurrection? I thought that was really compelling. And you're like, well, here's all the reasons we don't find it compelling. And they're like, oh, no one's ever mentioned that in Bible study. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's the way that it kind of worked. Yeah. Um, I've heard that it works. It depends on the person. Some people get converted with getting attacked yeah. or deconverted, rather. Or, and some people, it has to be, like, the, you know, the, the what is it? carried her stick that's the wrong thing love the bomb. honey getting the flies what am i trying to say <laughs> right. yeah yeah I I love bombing there's something to that i was at a i've brought this up on the podcast it's been like at least a year so i can do it again um i was at one of james randy's annual conferences in like 2008 or 9 and uh phil plate the astronomer actually mm. lives in boulder the infamous don't be a dick yeah, yeah. which was somehow infamous he gave a 30 minute talk that that ended up being titled don't be a dick and one of the things that he, he did at the beginning was like, hey, who in here used to believe something like Bigfoot or aliens or whatever? And a lot of hands go up. All right. Now, how many of you stop, stop believing because somebody got in your face and called you an idiot and, you know, whatever shouted at you? And only one person left their hand up and it was Paul Provenza, the comedian. <laughs> and the next day he explained that the person who shouted at him was Penn Jillette. But <laughs> so, so that aside, screaming at people and saying you're a fucking idiot doesn't change their mind. Yeah, right? but it's not necessarily screaming at someone and saying you're a fucking idiot because most people don't do that. But it's being mocked for being naive. Like, that's how everyone stopped believing in Santa, right? All their friends were like, oh my God, you still believe in Santa? Ah, look at the baby. And then you're like embarrassed. 
And yeah. And you go back, you're like, Mom, Dad, what about the Santa thing? And they're like, oh, shit. Just just don't tell your little brother. It's weird. Maybe it's only because I was thinking about the don't be a dick thing. But there's got to be a nicer way to do that, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's nice ways to do it, too. Yeah. I'm just... Both work in different situations. They do. And both don't work in certain situations. Yeah. So I guess... There's a lot of people who'd be like, fuck you. You're going to come at me? I'm going to come at you. Yeah. Places where it wouldn't work is where there's not enough shame for believing whatever the thing is, right? So like if you're a climate change denialist, you're not going to shame them into changing their mind because they've got a lot of people to go back and give them support, right? It's weird though because religious people have a lot of people to go back and give them support about the whole Christ thing too. I think I think it works more when there's already like a seed of doubt somewhere inside them yeah that's the difference is that the people who are coming to forums and asking questions are already having questions yeah. but yeah the drive for, for curiosity is a big helper there right. anyway weren't we responding to a feedback <laughs> oh yes okay so the thing that i actually wanted to respond to was Inyash jokes that debates is like a rap battle for intellectuals by doing that, there's an implicit statement that people who do rap battles are dumb when it, in fact, requires both a lot of training and quick thinking to do well in those. People who do rap battles are stereotypically black, and there's already an existing stereotype of black people being less intelligent, so the damage gets amplified by confirmation bias. And oh, dear God, that is not at all what I meant. And I was going to, like, reply with a whole big thing, but um, being in part apologetic, because obviously I did not correctly communicate what I was thinking when I said that, if that's what he took away from it. That is not his fault. It's in, in part at least mine for not being clear. But uh, someone replied for me. Here it is. Uh, before I could get to it, Soul21000 said, To defend Inuyasha's comment, rap battles and sports debates are similar in that they're both suboptimal at finding out what they purport to find out. The sports debates tend not to revolve around too, truth too closely, and a strong case could be made that rap battles don't do a good job of providing more intelligent lyricism. Lyricism. They tend to favor traits like humor, novelty. Should I read the... Okay. They tend to favor traits like humor, compare dumbfounded against tantrum during their classic grind time battle, novelty, Solkhan being Jewish and having a really low voice, and spectacle. Every single prop moment over long form traits like storytelling or rhyme scheme flexibility, which come out more in written rhymes. Uh, this isn't even getting into biasing effect, charisma, and reputation have on judging in both arenas. So a common thread is that they're the inferior form of a not-dumb art rather than simply dumb forms of art. And basically, yes. that that I was not trying to say that debating is like a rap battle because it's dumb, like rap battles are dumb, which dumb black people do. What I was trying to say is when you're having a rap battle, you are performing for an audience and you're trying to make people go, oh, shit, and like be entertained by how well you're like slamming this guy or being witty or it's it's about the spectacle. Right. Uh, and it's not it's not nearly the same thing as putting together something like um I'm going to date myself now, but something that uh, Dre or Nicki Minaj would do, or, or I hate to say Eminem because he's the white guy, but he was a pretty damn good rapper in his day. And they had the, he had that movie. Which, <laughs> seeing the trailer for that is the closest I've ever come to seeing a rap battle. So Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the, that, that's a different type of, of working on the musical art that you can't do in a rap battle. It, it requires sitting down and thinking and and refining things a bit and that's what i was trying to say that in a debate people aren't nearly as concerned with the truth uh they're concerned with entertaining the audience and getting them go oh shit and you know like yeah pwn that guy you know that that sort of thing i wasn't trying to say that i wasn't trying to compare it to a rap battle because they're dumb i was trying to compare it in that the point is to entertain the audience as opposed to get to the truth or write a compelling beautiful lyrical song you could use another analogy. What was the that Slate Star Codex endeavor where they had people who disagreed? Uh, the uh, uh, adversarial collaboration. Yes. Yeah. So like adversarial collaboration on on the one hand versus like the Bill Nye versus Ken Ham debate, right? Yeah. Those are not doing the same thing. Right. One is 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 bringing people who disagree together to try and find things that they can agree on in a convoluted subject, and the other is people delivering canned lines in front of an audience to try and people try and expose the other side to hearing their canned lines or getting good digs or laughs or whatever yeah mm -hmm. i don't even think they're doing that the like bill and i versus ken ham it's kind of they're just both just drawing their own audiences to yeah. watch them they don't even care about who wins they just want to like hear their their side talk i couldn't mm -hmm. sit through that nah. um maybe another example maybe a less ridiculous debate but i don't know two different 
like a theologian and a flaw like you know the ones like people debating dawkins and harris back in the early 2000s those seem to be like somewhat good natured and you would draw people in from both sides and support that or whatever but i think there are people who enjoyed watching those that I've weren't... watched a lot of those i love those yeah, yeah same no I, I totally agree but those but i i watched they them specifically to see that my side get good hits on the other side you know yeah that was why i was watching yeah i would get so annoyed during the parts where the theologian like the sophisticated theologian would talk about like the t you know tiny technicalities of you know the language was this but this and you know this like cultural context at the time I'm just like i don't care <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to explain to me like something about this book that i don't believe in and i don't care about this book like go and get back to richard dawkins or whoever i've always thought it'd be funny to be like yeah but it says here that the the dark lord from markham has his equal and that he'll come back to fight him and then lo and behold in the seventh book he comes back <laughs> like how does that prove the divinity of this of the that's the exact same kind of argument. How hard is it to write a sequel that confirms the, that continues the story of the first book? Yeah. Anyway, I know we're on a tangent. This yeah. has been a fun episode, so. Cool. I'm having fun doing it. I hope everyone's <laughs> having a fun time listening to us go on tangents. Yeah, and, and just, you know, for the record, I still really love those kind of sports debates. They're fun to listen to. Much I, like I also like rap battles, you know? Yeah, I actually don't like the sports debates anymore. No, I don't. I don't consider them ways to get to the truth, but I still find them fun to watch sometimes. If you find a good one, send it my way. It's been a long time. Sure. Yeah, I feel like I've heard all the arguments on both sides, at least with the atheism ones. Maybe yeah, if I found a I different topic. I don't bother topic. with the atheisms anymore, because, like you said, I've seen them all. Right. Maybe, like, AI. Um, is it going to doom us all? <laughs> that would be fun. That would be a fun one. There was a good one, um, I think I plugged before. It was uh, Massimo Piclucci. He was used to be the co-host on Rationally Speaking. Did a talking or blogging heads debate with Elias Yudkowsky on, um, on a number of things, but it was partly the AI, uh, foom and cryonics and, uh, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a lot of fun. That was a kind of, a, and they were, they were clearly strongly disagreeing in a way that I found baffling that Massimo was missing some of these points because he's a smart dude. Yeah. But Yudkowsky gets in a lot, some of those really, and depending on which side you're on, maybe you feel Massimo does the same thing, but Yudkowsky gets in some of those really good kicks of like, ha, oh, that felt great. Don't you feel dumb now? <laughs> yeah. Um, in moments, but they're still good natured because I don't think they came out of this hating each other, right? So uh, it was fun. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Did you find yours? Yeah, I've got it. It's just sort of long. It was um. So James has been a supporter on Patreon for a while, and he he, he writes in on some of the episodes, and on episode thirty seven. Thank you, James. Yeah, thanks, James. You rock. Um, we had a discussion about uh, so we were talking about flow states and kind of like you know so that was when he brought up like you know, kicking ass a guitar hero mm -hmm. and. Um, so James brings up that the diminishing returns from conquering something like Guitar Hero is because it has an easily definable per perfection, mm -hmm. where uh, at which point there's nowhere to go. I'm assuming once you beat uh, Dragon Force uh, through the through the fire and the flames, one of my favorite songs that I liked from that genre, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love listening to that in the car back when I used to speed a lot. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm assuming that was the hard mode song, right? Because that yes. song was super hard to like. Uh, that was not rock band. To. That was Guitar Hero three i think their final song but fair yes. enough yeah it I, was... I correctly guessed that was one of the hardest songs in the game because <laughs> yes. it's so awesome yeah um so part of so james goes on to say part of what makes athletics so enthralling to me is that the new heights are being defined in real time in front of your eyes and the space of ways in which uh to improve is so vast that you can't just point to perfection as the logical end point and i think that's a really good point that if you master something you know again by by beating the hardest mode of the game or something then say all right cool i did it and then I guess you can kind of keep doing that by seeing if you can get a better and better score or something. But once you've won, you've kind of won. Mm -hmm. um, I have a hard time, like once I finish a game, going back and finishing side quests and stuff. Because mm -hmm. like you're already like overpowered or whatever, or you feel like you've already completed it. So like well, the, some, the people, some people playing go, games were different though, because even though you could, you know, beat it on the hardest difficulty, it was still fun to do. Even if you could do a song perfect... It was fun to do it again perfectly. Totally. And it was like there was still skill involved. And just because you could do it perfectly once doesn't mean you could do it that way every time because it's really hard. That's the point. Mm -hmm. But what's fun I wanted to bring up about the, the sports thing is that you can look at videos of like 1960s Olympics and just see how ridiculously weak and sh and like <laughs> bad bad at jumping. And, well, like they could all beat all of us, but mm -hmm. like they, they couldn't jump as far. They couldn't run as fast. They couldn't throw things as far. Compared to now, the, 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 the athletes of today would just – destroy any olympian from 60 years ago yeah i think that's really fun to think about because you're because like james said the perfection there isn't really as defined and we can watch it grow and i i remember i think i saw like a gift set com comparison of 1960s long jump and stuff like that 
compared to now. And I'm like, holy shit. They, and of course they're all wearing like their, their super, um, polite. What's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, like covering oh. up clothes Overalls. with like, yeah, like modest, modest. Yeah. Oh. So like, it, you know, they, it just looks like maybe that's limiting their, their movement and stuff, but that's not just <laughs> it. They're just, people are trying harder and running way faster now. So anyway, yeah, they're also ruining their lives by training since childhood. Well, maybe yeah. not ruining their lives. They might be really enjoying it. And that's they're like dedicating their lives. Yeah. Doing push-ups since they were a fetus. It was much more of an amateur thing back back then. Well, I wouldn't. It probably wasn't even an amateur thing. It's just that people go to really ridiculous lengths in some Olympic competitions. Right. Like now, that is your life, and you have to be like of the highest percentile of genetic specimen with the perfect body type for that thing. And yeah, there's a lot more to it. Yeah, maybe the difference was 60 years ago, you still had to have a day job or something. <laughs> so like you ran like on your off hours, but you still worked an eight to five. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder what a lot of the difference is, actually, and whether we're going to continue to see the trends. I mean, there has to be, like, a ceiling at some point unless we start genetically engineering people or, you know, providing robotic augmentations. Have you seen the latest uh, Slate Star Codex post? Which one? Uh, the one about diminishing returns from exponential increase in inputs. Oh, no. Okay, the latest post is about how we keep getting less and less returns from more and more effort put oh. into things. Was that about science, though? Yes. Yeah, okay, I did read that one. Okay, yeah, that... that had the chart of the, like, marathon times and other things. Like, there are a lot of gains initially, and now it's, like, leveling off, where now new records are broken by one thousandth of a second increase over previous records, right? It's harder to eke out any more, any more advantage, because everything is being exploited more or less to the max in, in at least ways that we found so far. That's, so it's that's, kind of trailing off. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah it would that, be kind of fun, though, to see what else we could find, like some kind of weird, like, ketogenic diet, too, or, yeah. I don't know. I that's don't that I'll, know. I'll, resub I'll resubmit my, my, my in-favor position of a separate league of, of Olympians or sports, the people who are allowed to take all the drugs and... <laughs> Get all the surgeries. All the surgeries <laughs> and all of the genetic modifications that their parents can give them and just have this race of super mutants playing baseball and football. And then if we want, we can still have human football. But I think it would be just amazing to see somebody, you know, who could... You know, make they'd have to make bigger football fields. They have to make bigger diamonds. Right. You know, they'd have to have robots throwing these balls or whatever. Harder they'd have bats. to be like seventeen seven seventy four, where they're playing football across the entire United States. Yes, <laughs> baseball with giant mechs. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, but there's also been some increase in technology. Like the running surfaces uh, take less energy away now. Yeah, there's better sneakers and better shoes. Yeah, like sportswear. There's better diets again. Like the they've had to. Uh, oh, uh, they had to uh, outlaw. Not outlaw make against the rules the certain um what do you call the game where they shuffle board it on ice oh i know, what you're, I know what you're talking about curling yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you struggle with the name because curling doesn't make any fucking sense no, for the name of what they're doing right okay so that yeah uh, in curling the <laughs> I'm sure there's a great reason it's called that but if you told me something is called curling i'd be like oh that's like lifting, lifting weights. weights yeah, yeah. That's not, i always thought that's of someone running in front themselves. of like a, a little ball on or a little puck on ice and yeah. brushing or maybe ice like in front throwing of something in a curve or yeah. something yeah but no, uh, at curling, they, they had to make the new brooms take them out of competition because they were so good. Anyone could stop, or anyone you know with enough training and professionalism could stop the thing exactly where they wanted every single time. And the athletes were actually complaining, this isn't any fun anymore. We can always do exactly what we want. There's no sport to it. They, they had to make rules about what you can make your swimsuit out of for the swimming competitions because the newer ones were just giving too much of an advantage. So yeah, there, there's a number of things that, that change have changed some of it's kind of arbitrary too i find that funny like i was just talking about diets but it's like you can like you know do some kind of weird crazy diet but you can't take drugs right. but what's the difference and you can train in a low oxygen environment like up here in colorado where we're mile high or in the the tents that they have that have really low oxygen so your body slowly builds up more red blood cells and then when you go out into the actual arena where they're uh, where they're competing there's a lot more oxygen than what your body is already adapted for so you have an advantage right but that's you can't okay blood dope. but you can't blood dope yeah that, no. that's exactly the example i was going to bring up is like you can artificially blood dope with hard work but you can't just like have some have some blood boy give you you know a bag of a pint bef you know the week before the competition yeah yeah a kind of sadder and more controversial example is trans athletes mm. yeah i think there's a bit to unpack there part of it is that to the extent that there are or might be physical differences between between genetically male and genetically female bodies yeah. that if you have a genetically male body who, and I think part of it too is I, I the only context I've heard about this really talked about in is, is fighting because Joe Rogan's talked about it a couple of times mm -hmm. who I don't listen to that much, but it's come up a couple of times. If, if, you have, if you have a person who, who was assigned at birth male and transition or is like 
depending on where they're at in the transition or if they're if they're taking supplements or whether they're not or something, they can apparently, according to people who measure how hard people can hit, can hit harder than, than many women on average, right. including many women who fight. So like uh Well you have you know, a larger body. Yeah, different musculature muscles, and different uh, skeletal yeah. yeah, longer arms and like that's gonna give all the difference. So it's mm. kind of just like do you wanna let I think you get kind of annoyed people from at least three or four sides because it's like, look, this one person's going to crush everybody by a margin that makes this like not really fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, I don't know. There's not a really good analog for that. And I don't watch a lot of sports. I can't think of anything. So well, there's um, weight classes. It's kind of like, you know, putting someone in a lower weight class and making them fight someone of a higher weight class. That's it. And I feel like that could actually resolve the conflict, do away with men's and women's sports. But then people will be like, Oh no, what if, you know, Sexual things happen accidentally. <laughs> there's also, there's people that are why, why is there never a problem where guys are accidentally raping each other when they're boxing or wrestling, right? They are, but it's part of the game. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, okay. I've watched some mixed martial arts. It gets real, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's real saucy. If, if you pop a boner while wrestling a guy, it's like, oh, that just happened. But if it's with a girl, it's assault. Oh, okay. This is probably, that's an off, obviously off-color joke, but. I mean, I they think... don't generally pop boners at MMAs. I don't know how, what kind of fighting competitions you're watching. But. <laughs> yeah, there's there's also people that are intersex, which is kind of fun because then it's like, what you know, how do you classify them? Yeah. Because they, and then like it just gets back to the fluidity of gender too. I mean, you, people can transition at different ages too, so it's like it's a really like awkward question because you have to be like, okay, if you don't allow trans people to participate in certain sports, like, isn't that unfair to somebody who you know took puberty blockers? at age 10 and then like i don't think you take them at 10 I, I don't know what age you start and then like you've never actually had the chance to have male hormones and gotten a bigger you skeleton probably at some point you measure that you can measure it but but the question is where do you draw the line yeah then it's super draw arbitrary about where you're drawing lines and i think i remember like in it would have been like junior high or high school when i was like i was doing school sports i don't think it's and, all that arbitrary if you have ways to measure well but like measure what specifically I don't know the what they can do with skeletal structure, musculature, all those things. Make a weight class. Yeah, so like a, possibly like a, make a, a weight more, class, more stringent like, weight classing thing. A man in a, in the same weight class as a woman is still not going to have a fair fight when they're boxing. I think that's so. Then you have to measure other things, right? And right. Kind of like nerfing. that's what I'm saying. The the, the, way, the measurements would have to be more um, fine grained than just what the weight is. Yeah, and I guess but I don't you could know. probably do something along those lines. Yeah, probably. Yeah, there's a lot width. of science of people hitting each other in the face over and over and seeing, yeah. you know, all that stuff. I but. mean, dude, if we can fucking land that tiny that little thing on Mars, and have it, you know, sending us pictures a few minute hours later, we can we can totally get this. If it, yeah, with enough time and effort, we can have we can have we can have man on woman violence in MMA. That sounds great. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and finally everything will be good. <laughs> well, I, and this is, this is probably not the right way to think about it, but this was the answer I was given in like junior high and high school when I was getting into, uh, school sports was like in track, there was, there was no gender segregation, but in football there was, Okay. and I didn't, it, maybe there wasn't in junior high, but in high school, I think there was, there yeah, was that's like how a, my school was set up. Yeah, but there there was a girls' league and a and a boys' league in high school, mm -hmm. and I was like, why is there not just like one league and let the best players join the league? Mm -hmm. And the answer that I was given that was like, you know, it sucks, but like that's because all the guys would get it, none of the girls would. Yeah, and so the you know having the separate having them separate. every now and then there might be like one really exceptional girl yeah. that could make it in, but at, at which point they should let her play. join the boys team. They absolutely should. Yeah, maybe. But everyone else who wants to play wouldn't, uh, all the other girls that want to play wouldn't be able to. But yes, if one girl can make it in, totally. Use the best person for the for the job. Yeah. Like that uh, that uh, female kicker they had in, God, I don't even remember where it was. Sports. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere high school in, sports, I somewhere think. Somewhere in sports. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think the, well, I brought that up for the example that it would be, I don't know, you still want to like let everyone who wants to play, play. Mm -hmm. And then of course, there's also the thing that like, I think there are separate leagues for like women's chess, which does strike me as weird. That really? Um, I think the reason that I saw for that was that since it was historically and probably still is kind of a boys club, mm -hmm. that like having a girls league was like, look, you're not going to feel like ostracized by joining playing here. I'm not sure if it's like, weird. I don't know what they do at like world championships if, if men play women, but if they don't, that'd be stupid as shit, right? Yeah. I think they do because there was that post um, about training a genius on slate star codex and they're yes. talking about how the 
the guy had trained his three daughters to all be world-class chess players. Yeah. I sent that to my sister when she was pregnant. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> I was like, look, oh. you can have your daughter do whatever you want if you start early enough. Right. <laughs> but of course, chess is the kind of thing that you can optimize, you know. But I, you know, I don't see why you couldn't try something harder. Is I'm, she going to channel her kid into becoming a genius in some certain area? I'm not sure. She's okay. only six months old. There's still time to pick a profession. Right. Now but... you got to start early. Yeah. As long as she's to... picked something before 18 months, okay, you're good. We'll, we'll give it some more thought. Yeah. I mean, it worked with John Stuart Mill. He was kind of like a polymath at everything. Right. He had a mental breakdown and you know, not a happy life. But oh, uh, I didn't know that. But he he did he did crush it. And he's super famous. So yeah. you know, that's what really matters. Yeah. That's what all that really matters. <laughs> Okay, so that was a long digression on that, that thoughtful things that thoughtful thing that James wrote in. So thanks for doing that. Yeah. Um, Did you have anything, Jess? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, Reddit is where a lot of the comments come from. People can comment on the website and on Patreon directly too, yeah. or emailing us at the Bayesian Conspiracy Podcast at gmail dot com. Yeah. Or wait, Bayesian Conspiracy Podcast at gmail dot com. No the on the on the email. Right. I have one from Not Without Incident. Yeah. Uh, in our. I think two episodes ago, we talked about the map is not the territory, and you asked where that came from, and I said Eliezer first got it from uh, The World of Null A by Van Vogt, I think is the name of the sci-fi author, which is where he uh, ran into it. Not with that incident says, the map is not the territory is an important idea in math and philosophy going back almost a century. And linked us to a wiki, which showed that, a uh, Wikipedia page, showed that uh, a Polish-American scientist and... Okay. Polish American scientist and philosopher Alfred Korz Korzbinski. I, I was going to trust you to pronounce this correctly on the first try. Dude, shit. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I am so American, it's ridiculous. Uh, we'd have to ask my parents how to pronounce it. They could, like, snap it off. Uh, was first, um, is the, has the first citation of it in 1931. Um, and he says, or not with that instance, says, I think one of the biggest issues with the sequences in general is that, as part of his disdain for traditional academia, Yudkowsky isn't really into citation. Because of this, a lot of people in the rationalist community credit him with ideas from other fields, sometimes under a different name. And that's, that's fair. I did not know that this came has been around since at least 1931. Yeah, that's good to know. I actually have mm -hmm. to wonder whether, I mean, like, I imagine Eliezer knew that he, he probably researched it but maybe he didn't maybe he did find it from this sci-fi book mm -hmm. who was referencing you know maybe there's just a chain of references yeah i would bet the other way that he found it from the sci-fi book and didn't even wasn't even aware that there was some philosopher in the 30s who who coined the phrase but right. but yeah the point is true that yudkowsky it's sort of apparent well it's not like he has this hobby horse that he's hating on academia but he especially philosophy he shuts on a bit yeah because in his defense philosophy is kind of fucked it's, up. Well, it's it's the antithesis of what I think he wants rationality to be, mm -hmm. and that's why it's not rationalism because there's already a school of thought called that in philosophy. It's rash, it's rationalistness, rationality. Uh, yeah, rationality. Yeah. But that's also kind of the, the reason that he can get the good name of rationalism because there's already a name of that that's really not rationality. We'll call it Bayesian uh, rationality. Yeah, but the I think the disdain for philosophy in, in particular, and I am a big fan of philosophy. I've I've enjoyed it for ages. Um, it's, but the field itself doesn't have the kind of cut and dry way to weed out bad material that like good rationalists should. Yeah. It doesn't require evidence. Right. And, and you can still have debates now about like, is dualism true? Here's oh, this, God. read this cool new paper. Yeah. Like, so, and this is something that they teach you in all the classes and that you find in a lot of the books that like, unless you're ready, just like to pick a side and basically say, I'm just going to stop listening to the other side. You have to kind of just take as a, and this is oversimplifying, but hey, these are all open questions. And that's not like, so I think Yudkowsky's disdain is like, fuck that. We've been talking about these for thousands of years. We've got mm -hmm. some settled answers on a lot of these questions. Right. You know, these, these are not as open as they should be uh, or as open as you guys pretend that they are. So, you know what finally settled the atomism versus four elements debate? Fucking science. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. You wouldn't know it from the media. <laughs> they love those four elements. I hate the elements. Like, it makes me so mad. I, and I love, like, Avatar Last Airbender. Right. And I also like that they don't take the whole four elements thing that seriously. Like, it's obviously, they're using it as a plot device. That's mm -hmm. why, like, I actually, why am I talking about this? I didn't like Korra as much because they started taking the mysticism way more seriously, it felt like. Ah. Uh, I, I liked the beginning, like, how Korra started in that it was, I don't know, like, 60 years later or something. And they had started abusing the bending powers to like uh what was it who were the benders that could do electricity firebenders right 
Uh, probably. They just had like cores upon cores of firebenders basically working as uh, the generators for an electric of the city's electric grid. I was like, that is fucking sweet. You, you know, powering they're... water wheels as a waterbender, you could be you right. Know, moving. They, they industrialized their magic as any good society would. And that's kind of awesome. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, that part was awesome. Yeah, too. but I didn't like Korra very much either. I didn't see Korra yet. I, maybe I should skip it. There's there's some people that swear by it. Um, I I watched the first season and then I just gave up. And a few years later, someone said, what? That was the one shitty season. Once you get past that one, they get better. I'm like, god damn it. I don't, I'm not going to go back. I've given up on it already. On the plus side, with cartoon seasons, it's typically 20, 20, 20 to 22 minute episodes. Yeah, but like Avatar, the first Avatar was good from like the, the, the get-go. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And then it just kept getting better. Yeah. yeah. I really loved all of it. Avatar was great. And yeah. it even like had a surprising amount of like good emotional tugs for yeah. like you know 11 year olds throwing fireballs at each other right so i thought it was a good show it was so well written yeah mm-hmm. but yeah there's um i think it's the same team or some of the same writers that worked on avatar they came out with the new show called uh the dragon prince I, I might be getting that wrong i've heard of this but um actually yeah i watched the first season it's on netflix it, it is good but uh they started out with saying like the world is made of four elements again <laughs> and they make up four different elements and it's just like can we stop <laughs> it's not compelling anymore I, why would I, they make... I find it annoying why would they make four different elements because of everybody ones? got sick of the classic ones so they're like oh, we'll pick God. four more arbitrary things like but that's ice just... yeah <laughs> i think one of them's i, I forget it shows like, how like much disdain I had for this magic system <laughs> that I just don't even remember what the elements were. Yeah. It's like adding new Pokemon with new Pokemon types in the later games. Right, right. Yeah. Hey, it's the same idea but different. <laughs> yeah, although that had like a game behind it that they were trying to make more complex. Yeah, and it, it worked for that. I was kind of being tongue in cheek. Okay, wait. Can I just read? In the magical land of Zadia, magic comes from six primal sources: the sun, moon, stars, sky, earth, and ocean. The earth and the ocean. <laughs> and then human mages create a seventh kind of magic called dark magic. Dun, dun, dun. And they start capturing and harvesting the magic and they drain all the other kinds of magic. And it's just like, it made me so mad. Like, I don't care about any of this. You know I'm, I'm here mad? for the characters and like mm-hmm. the story, but... What made me mad there is that sun, sky, and stars are three different <laughs> elements. <laughs> oh. And none of it comes into play. Maybe it will later, but like, it's basically just that like, the, like all the other elements are fighting the dark humans and i think it's cool that the humans are the evil species and all the other species are like the good ones but, finally uh, yeah so i that, do that's think it's interesting fun. about something that tells you about their world though like their world might actually be flat with a celestial sphere above them that's, if you and that's you know whatever I, and that's that's all fine and, and you might be right <laughs> but I, I just like the idea that like okay cool you know sun in the sky sun also a star stars okay <laughs> right. whatever fuck me i guess <laughs> no i think like you know a system like that could have been cool I, I'll, I'll you know i love fantasy but you have to actually think through all the implications of your world like if the you earth were flat how would that affect gravity and like do you fall off the edge and of course or, you, you know... fall off the edge that's the point of having a flat earth yeah <laughs> But, like, you know, a lot of the times they just put stuff in there because visually they're like, wow, that's cool. And they don't really think through the implications. And then there's just mm. all these plot holes. And they're a... like, why even put it in there if you're not going to use it? There was their problem in Asgard in the Thor movies that there was, like, the big waterfall at the edges. It's like, where's that the water coming from if it's all just falling off the edges all the time? <laughs> they they're literally synthesize it. it. Yeah, yeah, it's they, going from they... magic. No, what happens is it evaporates and it goes back up into the space. <laughs> <laughs> space space clouds <laughs> rain down. Uh, yeah, Speaking, no, no, they, they could have like some kind of fusion furnace where they actually take nuclear power and just condense atoms out of it, right? That, or it's coming from literally magic or something, because there's a lot more magic in there than, than Thor's willing to acknowledge. That's but... basically magic. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. That said, speaking of Thor, the uh, the new God of War game takes place in Midgard, which is the, the, the Norse... Norse mythology name for Earth, mm. which you might have re- remembered from the first Thor movie when they're talking about the realms and this and that. So you visit some of the other realms, and then this, rather than Thor and Odin and stuff being the kind of happy-go-lucky, nice guys, they're like these total, utter monsters. And, so they're you know, like Odin's, accurate? Odin's this famous torture. Yeah, it's much more lore-friendly lore as opposed to MCU-friendly. But it was, <laughs> it was a fun twist, and I liked that. So, yeah. Did you have another one? Yeah, we've got one here from... Uh, Kale Silverhand, dope name by the way, on, on the rest on the modesty posts that we talked about. Yeah. Um, they had said that I feel like the hosts missed a crucial distinction on updating probabilities based on input from other people. The basic premise is that when two rational agents meet and share their data and pos- probabilities, they should at the end of the interaction have identical probabilities. One of the examples brought up by the hosts was that billions of people assign a high probability to Christianity being true, so shouldn't that count as evidence for Christianity, which was pointed out as the flaw in the modesty post. Uh, however, the post specifies rational agents. 
There's a lot of people, or excuse me, there's a lot of evidence that people believe Christianity is true for non-rational reasons. Therefore, in my opinion, it's just not, not justified to update your beliefs based on those people. As flawed rationalists, we can be relatively certain that no other being we encounter is perfectly rational. Therefore, we should never update our probabilities purely on the probabilities given by anyone or anything. We should require evidence and reasoning as well and make our judgments based on that. So I feel like that was kind of a good hybrid point, and the the Christianity puzzle, maybe I didn't deliver it right in that post, but that was sort of brought up as a, a way to kind of just bring an intuition pump that there isn't, it's not enough to hear a counter position enough times to update. It, there needs to be more to it than that, and, and Kale Silverhand hit it on the head. So, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, did you? Yeah. It, okay, I think, so this brings up a really interesting aspect of the whole overcoming bias slash res, less wrong uh, original reason for being it's um i i don't want to use the, the french version of that because it sounds too pretentious go for it because i don't know what it is uh raisin d'etre okay. i believe is how it would be pronounced uh, i've definitely heard that i didn't know what that yeah right. yeah uh but the i'm uncultured but i'm not that uncultured <laughs> <laughs> okay uh the the thing is the this all originally spawned from the oh god was it the si4 forums A correction, that's the SL4 forums, not SI4. Um, it, it, was, it was a community of people talking about how to build AI and the coming... <laughs> I, I don't want to say the coming robot overlords, but, you know, the post-singularity world where we will have programmed beings that can both uh, think and upgrade themselves and interact with the world as as actual like beings right except in machines in, in computers artificial intelligence uh and so a lot of a lot of the discussion pertains to how to think about thinking when you are trying to create that sort of uh intelligence and how they would work on updating probabilities how we can relate it to our lives a lot of this is about making programming god right like how do you make a god uh so it turns out friendly and so that it knows what we want and informs accurate beliefs in general yes exactly so a lot of the rationality project uh was butted uh, butted from this original kind of almost platonic rationality discussion about like the ultimate true rational agents that can see each other's source code and backtrack through how that other agent came to this belief and so now you have shared evidence and and it doesn't quite apply to humans, exactly. The platonic form of the rationalist. <laughs> yes. The platonic form of the rationalist is a machine god. <laughs> so, uh, so it's it's interesting that it doesn't always translate directly to humans. Because, yeah, we cannot uh, ex ex um, not explore. We cannot see each other's source code, right? We uh, can't even see our own source code. You what? I said we can't even see our own source code. Right, exactly. Uh, and we... So... That, that is why we, the, the rationality arts do not translate perfectly to us. For, for humans, they're more of an art than, than a theorem. An exact calculation, yeah. Yeah. And to be fair, Kale Silverhand does say, as flawed rationalists, we can, et cetera, et cetera. So right. we're doing our best. But yeah, in the, in the game where you're playing with perfect players, yeah. then it's, it's, the rules are different. And every... actually, actually, I guess you can actually just follow the real rules rather than approximate them like we have to. Right. Yeah. And so every now and then that does come up in these sequences where it it becomes clear that a lot of the discussion comes from thinking about the plat platonic machine god rationalist and pointing out how that doesn't quite fit with how we try to uh, implement rationality as humans, which is where I think uh, Eliezer was coming from with the modesty post. Uh, he was responding to the Amund, Amund's agreement theorem that says that two rationalists cannot agree to disagree. They will eventually um, come to the same answer when they compare all their priors and, and the evidence that they've accumulated. But that doesn't really work for humans because we can't do that the same way that a perfect rationalist would. Yeah, I mean, like, and also there's preferences that you can't agree on. I don't know if that's relevant or not, but for example, if I like pizza and Stephen likes soup, <laughs> then like you know we can talk about it all day and if we're two perfect rationalist gods we can give our best arguments but like in the end you know we just have two different preferences yeah. soup is clearly the superior food because you can carry it in a thermos <laughs> 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 and i have a strong value towards carrying my food in thermoses <laughs> yeah no that's a good point that non uh 
and I'm sure there's a word for this that I'm blanking on, I guess, I mean, subjective versus objective truths, right? Um, yeah. So, like, objectively, there's not a fact to be found about what's, what's better unless we can define important parameters, but, like, nutrition, taste, or whatever, right? Mouthfeel. Um, but subjectively, I might just like one more than the other. And so, yeah, those that's an important uh, distinction to draw, too. And that's why humans are cool. Yeah. yeah. We can and argue it's about. not cool that we're not, like, perfect robots, but we do have this kind of cool experience that we get from being awkward and broken. <laughs> Speaking of having cool experiences, uh, J. Michael wrote in on my joking suggestion for the aspiring supervillain to <laughs> pump a bunch of dmt into the local water supply a la mm-hmm. like scarecrow from the first batman movie mm-hmm. the first good batman movie um regarding the suge- regarding the suggestion of quote dmt in the water unquote normally i'm all for consensual participation as well but philosophically <laughs> if enabling people to experience the perce- to scream <laughs> <laughs> if enabling people to experience the perception of correctedness uh, of, of connectedness can help them be less despicable person and actually be more mindful and empathetic of others, then that'd be theoretically increase the consideration, cooperation, save lives, reduce suffering, improve humanity as a whole, so on. So uh, it seems like uh, grownups like knowing better and making their kids eat vegetables or, you know, at least an ask for forgiveness later situation. Um, that said, I don't really endorse this idea. That, yeah, he, he's, that or... said, if you're seriously considering being a crazy supervillain, there are worse things that you can do, like blow up the earth or something, right? right. So, so I'm kidding. I, never, I, never drug anybody without asking. Unless yeah. you can drug the whole planet at once, then maybe just see what happens. I, I kind of see J. Michael's point. It's the same kind of thing where um, Ozzy Mendias murders all of New York in order to get the world to unite and not destroy itself in nuclear fire, you know? Right. Uh, this is the, the antagonist of Watchmen, not the blogger. Antagonist... <laughs> Or protagonist That's right. of Watchmen, depending <laughs> on how you read it. You ever notice that always make, they, make, they always make the utilitarian the bad guy? Yeah. When he clearly, he saved the world. Yeah. I mean, sure, people died, but a lot less people than otherwise would have. Well, that's the reason found... people don't like effective altruism either. Yeah. Bunch of nerds. Ozzy, <laughs> Ozzy did nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> on the one hand, I see his point. Uh, on the other hand... I think there's very strict norms around con, um, consensuality, consent, consent yeah, that uh, are there for a very good reason. And I would rather blow up half the United States than blow up the planet. Yes. Even if it's half the United States that I'm on. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. I'm right in the middle, so. Yeah, ha. but I mean, that's assuming that you're in a situation where you have to choose. You know, you're in a trolley problem situation, push this button to blow up the planet versus not, like. But he kind of was. But you don't know where the he earth is going to go War, if you don't right? give people DMT. That's, the, I guess, Ozzy has this, whatever, hand wave that he was supposedly way smarter than everybody else. Oh, I so, thought we were still talking about DMT, never mind. Oh, no, yeah, you're right. With the DMT thing, I'm I, I'm totally kidding. Don't, don't, uh, that's, that's I, never, I think the poster don't was Don't drug kidding. people without their <laughs> consent. Right. Well, I mean, the poster kind of has a, po- so, I, I, I take this, I think people have to have done something wrong first in order for you to take their consent away to make them better people. Like the Clockwork Orange, like children. Sy- <laughs> the what? Like, like children, like, like be children, it, like be a yes. child. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I I take the Clockwork Orange example where I think they absolutely did the right thing by making uh, what's his name? I don't remember. I didn't see the movie. Oh, okay. Uh, the protagonist. Yeah, the, the kind of the main character. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they absolutely did the right thing by making him unable to be violent anymore. And I, I do not give a fuck if now he can't enjoy Beethoven or now he doesn't have the ability to defend himself when someone wants to beat him up. If we I kind of ha- care about that latter thing. Eh, you know, maybe he shouldn't have murdered people and been randomly violent and raped people. Once you've gotten to that point, society has a vested interest in making sure you can't do that anymore. Yeah, but you put them in prison. I mean, you can put them in prison or you can subject them to this treatment, which will actually let them be productive members of society again and will ensure that they aren't able to be violent, which they still could if they got out of prison. They can be violent to other prison inmates. I mean, there's, I think... But idealistically, one of the four things that prison is supposed to be able to do is remove people, dangerous people from the population. Yeah. So it's like, we can't fix you because we don't have the tools. Whether it's the psychology tools or the drugs or whatever, we can't make you better. Yeah. But we can take you away so you minimize the harm you can do yes and so. they actually could make him better and there's a lot of people like oh free will or whatever i'm like no yeah. fuck free will well, man the, the problem is they didn't make him better though they basically tortured him and he kind of continues to be tortured the rest of his life which i don't agree with if they had actually you know if the movie had been different and they kind of um you know changed his preferences so now he likes being a good citizen then that would be cool 
he's not tortured tortured though he just can't engage in violence anymore and can't listen to beethoven uh the, the like conditioning process definitely was torture <laughs> they like okay. pulled his eyes open and <laughs> you're allowed to be tortured for a few days if you've murdered and raped people I... <laughs> especially if it makes you be able to be in society again see i would put another shelling fence around torture where i don't think you should ever torture anyone and it's for the same reasons that you might you know not want to give everyone dmt i think I, I basically agree with you but if it if it comes to the point where you have you have done certain things and this will fix you then it's more like a surgery than like torture yeah i, I think surgery is also very painful you know but then you, you can you can agree to surgery or something but yeah maybe if you didn't want to like maybe well, even, he did actually agree to it being in the held movie. down while they gave you a shot that like just gave you compassion again because you never had that like that might be an uncomfortable experience but that's different than being tortured for days yeah he wasn't given compassion he was just uh made to be in incredible discomfort whenever he got an urge to do something Interesting. That's one way to keep somebody in check. Right. It, it, it would worked. Sure. So, but, Inuyash, if you had if you had the switch, that, or if you had two syringes, one which would make him super uncomfortable whenever he had an urge to do something bad, mm -hmm. or one that would make him happy whenever he had an urge to do something good, you'd probably give him the second one. Yes, absolutely. So, if you have better tools, you use those, but yeah. maybe they were using what they had. Yeah. No, I think they had prison in that world. They could have just thrown him in prison. I'm not sure prison's a better option. Prison well, is pretty fucking torturous itself. Actually, that's a good point. And costs a lot of money. Swedish prison... My only that thing on, work on him. the only thing I'll touch on prison there wise is that I always make an effort to keep the economic arguments aside from the moral arguments. Mm -hmm. Like how much it costs doesn't matter on how good it is. I get right. that there's a cost yeah, 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 that, yeah. that we have paid for, but saying. like that was my, that was always my thing with like the the death penalty. Even before I came, I was undecided on the death penalty for a long time. Um, but even before I came down on it, I was like, no, we, we're not looking at the dollar amount on keeping these people alive versus killing them. That's not yeah. the moral question. That's just the dollar amount of how much it costs. Right. If it was cheaper, that would be the better thing to do morally. No, right. Mor morals are more highfalutin than, than, you know, the, the economics of it. Yeah. Granted, if it was bankrupting the country to do something or whatever, and people were starving, you know, fine, make it absurd. But since it's not that absurd yet anyway. So yeah. Anyways, uh, people, I, I, in my opinion, people who have fucked up the social contract could be subject to DMT to make them better people. But uh, I, I wouldn't want to just arbitrarily do it to everyone without their consent. Because some people haven't ever taken DMT, don't want to take DMT, and are still decent people. Yeah, that said, okay, last thing on that. Well, no, fuck it. I was going to just like name like an evil person, you know, like Uday Hussein or something. Mm -hmm. If we could grab him and you know put him in a room for a week with you know a bunch of MDMA, a bunch of DMT, and a bunch of LSD... And then just like see if he has a better person at the end of it. Would that be an okay experiment to do? Yeah, sure. But he's, yeah. he's tortured good. a lot of people to death. <laughs> but he wouldn't. He's 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 like a monster who would like ride up to people's weddings and like you know rape the bride and then cut her up and feed her to feed her to his dogs. Like he was like he was his dad was Saddam Hussein. He didn't have a chance. Like right. so like his free will is like not really coming into it's it's like yes he, in he his case I think that's birth, totally right? a, a legit experiment to run yeah it's kind of I don't, I don't think it would have the effect that people think it would have yeah. i don't think, I don't think dmt so can change someone that much i i and i, I, I think don't... after a week he'd go right back to being a day hussein yeah i think people have to be open to change yeah to, like themselves changing yeah. in order to change there's a lot of people that do a lot of drugs and they don't change as people and there's a lot of people who do but i think those are the people who are looking to change That's but true. that being said i don't think there's a moral prohibition against forcefully changing people to stop being monsters we don't want monsters. It's okay for their, for us to use force to stop monstrosity. I think where I'm having trouble is the idea of punishing someone. It's kind of, it feels like the same kind of justification people would use for torturing someone for doing something bad. Right, but I'm not doing it, or I'm not advocating this in order to punish him. I'm advocating this in order to reduce the total amount of monstrosity in the world. Like punching Nazis? Uh, I, <laughs> I don't think punching Nazis has that effect. But if it did, if we'd been, oh yeah, that was the conclusion you came to, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, and I, 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 I see where you're coming from and I, I didn't bring this up as something I would be in support of. I was just kind of thinking of it and you brought up a good point that I think people who want to change might be more open after trying these things, but if they don't, they don't. Right. Um, I, and I recently got some evidence for this by asking somebody who I knew had tried LSD several times in their youth and they're not youthful anymore. And they're still, uh, I don't know standard conservative bigot style like you know not a big fan of gay people not a big fan of minorities whatever hmm. and i was curious I'd, I'd, i basically wanted to check did you ever try lsd as a kid and they're like oh yeah a bunch of times as a teenager in 20s and something i was like oh so it doesn't automatically automatically make you a more like inclusive understanding person hmm. maybe it made them more but not all the way or something i think they gotta try mushrooms for that all right well, I, I, I think maybe it's not just a morality inducing drug yeah 
It's it is an openness inducing drug though, or at least mushrooms are. I think LSD is too. I think so. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, that's kind of interesting because I do think that high levels of openness correlate with you know lower ra- uh, rates of bigotry. Couldn't high levels of openness just make you more susceptible to Nazi propaganda as well? If that's what you are subjected to, while I open? think it's openness of like experience and understandings. So it's like so you could really understand about how the subhuman races are really fucking things up, right? I mean, that's the danger of opening your openness. That's why I kind of worry about it. Um, I think I think we're 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 equivocating the use of the word open. Well, what we need to do is run some experiments by taking a nice, peaceful person, give them LSD, and then subject them to Nazi propaganda and see if they become worse. Well, it does make you open to more ideas, which you know you still have to have the kind of mental framework there of uh, like. You know, maybe you just have more option generations, and then you're able to pick the best option where you wouldn't have generated seven options. You would have generated three previously, and that's cool. But somebody who doesn't have that, you know, can just, like, become a crazy UFO person really easily. I also meant that kind of as a joke. Like, I don't think that would be moral to do. But on the other hand, I would be interested in finding out if this is actually a thing that would happen. I feel like Dark Lord Inyash is, like, a force to, like, actually be worried about. No, I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm not dark. There's, there's a difference. I would just, I just wanted to see what happened. Yeah. <laughs> that was, like, that Saturday morning breakfast cereal comic a couple weeks ago where um, the wife comes home and she's telling the husband, honey, it's twins. And the, the husband's like, oh, my gosh, this is so great. We can, like, buy two sets of clothes, two sets of this. And she's like... Yeah, that's why I'm excited. And then it's like earlier at the doctor when he's telling her it's twins. She's like, yes, I have a control group. Yeah. <laughs> All those twin studies I can add to. Um, we got a, another feedback here from Morgina Mail, uh, who is our good friend, Matt Freeman, at the Doof Media slash We've Got Word podcast. Hi, Matt. And this one's on task or management systems if you wanted to do this one. Yeah, that's why I got pulled out. Morgina Mail says, making a task management system is itself work and takes time. If you do it right, the work you invest in task management saves you work slash time later by optimizing how you spend the rest of your time. There's a constant trade-off. It's entirely possible to spend too much time on task management for tasks that you could have just knocked out in any order. I like that. I think that's a, a good thing to keep in mind. And there's a fun example from my work where we use a, a agile management tool called Rally, which allows you to like visual have like virtual boards of like all your stories have you have uh the points available all the tasks down to hours etc cetera, etc cetera. and you can get pretty deep with how all, how deep all this business goes and basically the point where it can end up taking like 30 minutes a day which is a not insignificant chunk of your of your eight hour work day right. yeah so it's kind of funny that like you know in, in this in this sense there might be enough of a benefit from it that management has transparency into what you're doing and stuff but if you're doing that to manage your own personal products that seems like a complete waste of time Could be. like for example, Rachel and I put together a Kanban board for our uh, wedding planning, <laughs> and um, it was great. But we're not doing task hours and you know managing da- things down to the minutia because we're just communicating this to ourselves. Is Bon a a not metaphor? A what's the word that means the same thing as? Uh, you're asking if it's an acronym? No, not acronym, not simile. Um, I don't know what you're talking about the thing that the sources have. Yes, what, exactly. What the fuck is this word? I'm not sure what you guys are talking about. There's words that there's two words that mean the same thing. Uh, it starts with an S. Synonyms. Synonym. Thank you. Man. Is bon a synonym for pro? Uh, I think kanban is one word. It's Japanese. Yeah, it's Japanese. Oh, it is? Yeah. Okay. I was about to feel really stupid having just realized that it's like a pro-con list where the word pro has been replaced with bon, so it rhymes. Oh, that'd be fun. No. No. It's not <laughs> What's the Japanese word mean? Oh, I'll find out really quick. I used to know, and I forget. And I should know, but I don't, because who cares? Cause... I'm sorry. So, I took I, this I'm entirely s- off the rails with this one word that I couldn't think of, because my brain doesn't work today. No, you're great. There's a... While I look up the definition, there's there's a great reminder here that I have for myself that there was that quote that probably Einstein didn't say, but people attribute to him, that uh, never memorize anything that you can look up in a book. Mm. And my version of that is never memorize anything that you can Google, which is everything. So yeah. wh- why bother committing anything to memory <laughs> as long as you remember how to Google it? So Because it does take you less time to remember a string of numbers than to look them up. That's Sometimes. true. Yeah, if you use it a you lot, you probably do it. It depends on the string. <laughs> yeah, and also there's like, when you open your phone, you can get distracted by lots of other things. Yeah. That's why I like to memorize my task list. No, that, and that's fair. And I, I, that, my, my thing is pretty tongue-in-cheek. I still need to memorize some stuff. Um, it took me an embarrassingly num- long number of years to memorize Rachel's phone number. So <laughs> it took me an like embarrassing seven. long number of minutes to recognize, remember the word for synonym. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's... Which, if I had my phone on me, I could have just went to the sources.com <laughs> and been like, what is it that you provide? So anyways, you and Rachel have a Kanban board for your wedding. Yeah, but we're not doing, we're not tasking it down all the way to like subtasks and hours and doing all this stuff. We're doing it at the level that makes sense for us. Cool. And so really the point for me was, this is sort of like, this is a task management system thing, so it's sort of relevant. Although I, re- I think it's a bit of a digression because it's super personal and not really applicable to anybody else. But here we are. Well, I think... I think it is relevant, and I think weddings do tend to be these logistical nightmares, so the fact that you guys are doing that. And I think a lot of people probably do use task management systems for weddings. Yeah. My idea for the Kanban board was mainly because I knew what it looked like, and I liked the system of having it, like, so I think we've got four categories. We've got, like, our defined. Like, this is stuff that we understand, like, that needs to be worked on, but we need to get some stuff together before we can do it. Then there's the ready-for-work category, and then there's the... Um, I don't even know if we have an in-progress, oh, there's an in-progress category, and then there's the done category for stuff we've done. Cool. But part of the reason I wanted to do this was I didn't really know a lot of what went into a wedding. So, like, other than what I've seen from the movies and the one or two weddings I've been to in my life, I didn't have a lot to work with. So, I found it helpful to have an illustrated thing to look at to do it all for, so. <laughs> Things to research. Yeah. Anyway, fun stuff. Yeah. Um, Mardona Mill is right, and... I like don't mean to come off as everybody should be using task management systems either. I like to use productivity tools and task management systems because I personally find it fun and also because I have problems with procrastination and time management and it helps. Um, the system that you were talking about that you use at work, Stephen, mm-hmm. you can actually test whether taking those 30 minutes of every eight hour day is improving the group's productivity or not. You can also kind of get an intuitive sense of whether you're actually performing you know, better yourself, doing more tasks than you would have done otherwise. And it, yeah, it can get to be distracting. And I definitely have spent some time, like what I had to like quit using Todoist because it had too many widgets. You could like, I think I was tr- telling you guys last time that you can like name your task, color code it, and then add a custom icon to it. And then you can drag it into a, like a subgroup of like household tasks. And then you can, it's just like, it had too much stuff. And I was spending so much time like doing all of that stuff that it was taking time away from tasks. And I found it fun. So at least it, it's not like a total waste of time. But if you're miserable and you hate doing task management, maybe don't. Yeah. Or, you know, if it is helping you, then maybe suck it up and do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. And and there are other metrics things to consider. And that's part of what, what our, our, Uh, management tool does is that like a it is really nice to be able to like all right i'm done at this what's next and you don't have to like remember you don't have to go find it it's just right there the next thing on the board which is nice to be able to see but the other thing that it does that is hard to put a dollar or like put a productivity value on is like give transparency to your boss's bosses so like they're they believe that you are doing enough work or something right Mm -hmm. or like maybe oh yeah they don't have enough people they need more people on their team so it gives a level of of visibility higher up that just like me telling my boss to tell his boss to tell their boss wouldn't really help with, right? So, um, yeah, productivity. Sometimes the tools are for more than just getting stuff done. Yeah, there's more to say about that, too. Like, the whole, you know, productivity, there's, like, a cult of productivity where you can get way too obsessed with it and kind of, like, use that as the one metric of your worth. And uh, I don't want anyone mm-hmm. going down that path either. Right. I know I struggle with that, too. But, like, you know, getting lots of tasks done isn't everything. There's, like, you know, working on your mental health or, like, finding fulfillment in life <laughs> so uh find fulfillment in life by doing things and being productive exactly but but there's there's other things too that like it's hard to measure is there other things well like consider like as a writer like your your measure of productivity is probably correlated with words per minute or words per day mm-hmm. but it's not the same as because you could right. really spend all day writing garbage yeah. yeah so like I don't know how you measure the rest of it because I'm not a writer, but there's some there's some you, difference. You where... don't. <laughs> <laughs> you're just like I think these are good ones, and every now and then you hear about the writer that bangs up three books a year, and you're like, don't I don't think those are good ones. <laughs> you know what you could do? Hmm. You could do your draft and then do a total word count, and then after all your edits, see how long it is after that, and then put together a ratio of how much stuff you end up cutting hits the, like says on the, leaves lives on the cutting room floor after that, right? Mm-hmm. And then you could see maybe how ma- how how many words what you want you see what I'm saying, right? How many words sort that you write every day on average make it to the end product? Yeah. And then you see how productive that day really was. Yeah, but and that'd be, want... that'd be another metric by which to evaluate. Obviously, I'm not a writer, which yeah. is coming up, and like this is probably you, you don't bad want to do anything that would, or at least I don't want to do anything where the numbers matter more than what's actually on the page, right? Or I wouldn't want to be like, oh, man, I cut a thousand words from from that week. So that was obviously a bad week when like, no, cutting those thousand words actually made the book significantly better, you know? So that should be counted as thousand word win. Yeah, sometimes cutting more words makes your writing 
a lot better than it was previously. Yeah, often. <laughs> and then sometimes you'll write something that you barely need to cut anything from, and it's great. Mm-hmm. So, so that you can't really judge. Maybe the takeaway here is that we're lucky that publish or like people aren't paid by the word on what they write. Oh, they are. Wait, really? Uh, if you write short stories, yes, all the markets pay you by the word. So you have an in- you have an incentive to make it. That's like that's like getting like a you know whatever a three page minimum on a paper at uh-huh. school. And it's like this is a great two pages. I'd be happy to use longer words and filler sentences. I mean, but there's also the thing where the it's more filler you use, the worse it is. Yeah. So first of all, it'll be a worse experience for your reader, and second of all, you're unless until you're like a really big name where they'll buy your shit no matter what. Uh, there's the greater chance that the editor will just be like, no, this isn't good enough. You, you have, you've obviously got like something good in here, but it's surrounded by so much turd word that, <laughs> yeah, turd I'm, word, not, like, <laughs> that I'm not going to buy it. So that's true for short stories, but maybe not for like no. novels. N- with novels, you get an advance and then you get, you know, a portion of, uh, of what you sell. Oh, good. Cause it's very plausible to think that Robert Jordan, the author of the wheel of time got paid by the word for the, no. like, the no, they middle. they haven't been doing that since Dickens time. It was like the book series is 15 books long and mm-hmm. it could have easily been 10 or 11. All right. Um, which sucks because a lot of it's so strong and good. And then there's like a few books in the middle where it's like, holy shit. Come well, on, okay. man. Here's, here's the thing. R- writers don't get paid by the word when they write novels technically, but they, they kind of get paid by the book. Yes. So. And series sell better. And once you have someone like in for a multi-book series, they tend to keep going with the series no matter what you do which is why lots of series get dragged out way longer than they ever should have been. It's the same reason sitcoms and TV shows generally <laughs> go for many years past when they should have gone because people will continue to watch, so they continue to rake in money. Until they finally get canceled, yeah. Exactly. And then they get worse and worse. Yeah. yeah. Then, like the last three seasons of House. Right. And so, yeah, there's there's a number of series out there where I'm like, I don't think you need this many books to tell this story, but... I realize that you like having your mortgage paid. So, well, good on Christopher Paloni for stopping at four books with his inheritance cycle. Right. And I think, you know, J.K. Rowling had the seven, but it would have been kind of really annoying for her to keep, like, they'd be like Harry Potter 2.0. It's like, no, he's a grown up. <laughs> but, like, that was never the point of the books, right? So, yeah. like, having the seven years of school, one, that kind of made sense. Maybe it's, maybe it's easy to when you have hard limits, but. Uh, uh, but like there's like the cursed child <laughs> yeah. we're gonna pretend that didn't happen right i read that it was so bad oh man you're the only person i've ever met who actually read it oh we'll my have god to have a conversation it was so bad that. no I, yeah okay. or not i don't know if i want to Sounds, no, well, I'll, I'll I, 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 def- I desperately want to one thing i just i just want to tell you one thing but i won't say it on the podcast because it's a spoiler well, we but, can cut it out although i don't know if anyone cares oh okay spoiler so, for the <laughs> cursed child coming up yeah. stay tuned so there's you know the characters who are um the main characters are the children of you know harry and hermione and etc uh and and then like there's an antagonist and the reveal is that the antagonist is voldemort's daughter <laughs> okay they, how did Voldemort have a daughter? <laughs> I forget how they even explained it. Wasn't there it a large amount of time travel involved? Yeah, uh, and like that part of it was kind of cool on one hand, but on the other hand, it just like if you you know are a rationalist, you're gonna hate it because they aren't munchkin incorrectly or at all. Yeah, <laughs> which is and it's all I don't know. I think I did hear about the time travel thing. So wait, why is the fact that the protagonist or the antagonist being Voldemort's daughter? Why is that a bad thing i don't think it landed for me well it's like they I, they obfuscated like who the antagonist was and then like it was like the, this big mystery and it's just like I, I just you know that's a really terrible decision like and this takes place oh i guess i this may be part of the setup this takes place when harry's kids are at hogwarts yeah oh okay how did Voldemort have a kid that's their age? I don't even... How do I not even remember that? I hated this book so much that I think I, like, actually, like, forced myself to forget it. Nice. That happens. That's the <laughs> no, way to do it. It, cause, no. it, was, it was also just really poorly written. Like, the a lot of the dialogue felt really weird. Did she write it or did she just endorse it? Uh, I can't remember. I think she, she didn't, like, write it. at all. She it was. She was involved. She I don't was know involved. how much she was involved. Yeah. That's a bummer. Anyway, authorship. Sounds tough. I'll stick around to not creating anything. So hey, you're creating a podcast. I was going to say other than this. Okay. Which, <laughs> Excellent. let's be honest, someone's going to say they're, Stephen's not a good author today, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Our final feedback is Captain QWERTY, who in the subreddit posted a recipe for guilt-free chocolate in response to um, Jess saying that there was no really good sweets that we could eat yet. So uh, I don't know. I don't bake, but maybe you can give it a try. I don't actually have the recipe here, but I'll post a link to it on our website thanks captain cordy yeah and finally who said there were no good sweets me (laughs) for uh i I guess i missed i forgot the context that don't have lots of calories i was getting annoyed about the fact that we haven't like you know managed to come up with technology oh that's right you know make healthy food taste like unhealthy food awesome yeah i'd be down for some 
guilt free sugar or guilt free cookies. I mean, a less or chocolate is something that I would probably love because I love fats and salts, you know, much more than I like Wait, sweets. What is it? Alestra. It's a substitute fat, uh, but apparently causes anal leakage. Oh. So there's <laughs> there's a downside, and I, I don't want to wear an adult diaper everywhere. So yeah. Yeah, there was a Jeff Foxworthy joke from the early 2000s about like medications, and that was one of the side effects. And it's like anal seepage. It's not even fun to say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's not a trade off I'm prepared to make. No, it's kind of like you know, yeah, you can have lab grown meat, but it's three thousand dollars a gram, so it's like I'm not prepared to make that trade off either. Yeah, there is some vegan meat that's actually pretty good, but oh, totally. it's very overpriced. It's compared to you know real meat. It yeah, some real meat. Yeah, some some of the stuff. Some of the stuff you can get at Safeway. I'm I don't I have no idea how ethically sourced it is, but it's vegan like meat patties and stuff from like what Morningstar or something. Like they come in, they come in a box that live in the freezer. It's nothing fancy. I'm not sure if it's but... even overpriced in so much as real meat is underpriced because of all the subsidies. Could be yeah. And it tastes slightly worse than real meat. So like I feel like you end up going back to the real meat unless you have principles hmm. or like really strong willpower. That's probably a fair point. Or dietary restrictions. Should we thank the uh, patron? Yeah, patron? I think we should. Uh, this week, we would like to thank our patron. Patron? Patron. <laughs> I, I hate that freaking website is. Yeah. Not, that reminds uh, me. Do you know what you get if you give an EV cash to evolve? If you give an EV? EV, the Pokemon. You can't give them cash. Well, you know, like how you can give them like the Firestone to turn them into Flareon, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. Oh, this is like a joke. Yeah. Okay. What do you get when you give an EV cash? Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that was pretty good. <laughs> I knew it was coming and it still made me laugh. That joke will either lose us Patreon supporters or gain us a Patreon supporter. <laughs> if you would like to be one of our Patreons, <laughs> uh, this the, the patron we're thanking this week is Glenn Willen. Uh, thank you for supporting us, Glenn. Thank you in general. People over the last several episodes have been coming out and giving more support every week. I see more names going up and it's fucking inspiring. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it means a lot. And it, it uh, one of these days we'll have the funds to increase the quality of the podcast, which I'm looking forward to. So, me too. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Thanks, everybody. Woo! All right. All right. And we're out.